Good afternoon. Before we formally convene this hearing, I want to thank your College of Pennsylvania for their tremendous and continued hospitality and offer Dr. Pamela Gunter Smith, the, the president of your college, a, a, a welcome to everyone. Thank you for bringing this group to your college. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, this uh, uh, room, which is York View uh, Hall, has the best view of York College anywhere. And it's very significant because if you look out on one side, you see actually the city of York. On the other side, you see our campus. And we say it really represents the engagement that the college has within, within the city. We have over uh, 4,100 students, 1,000 employees, uh, and you know, although we're a nonprofit, the economic uh, uh, state of, the, of this area as well as the Commonwealth is very important to us. Our students come from the local area. They tend to stay here. They do their internships, their co-ops, and that way they actually become a part of the community our hope is that they will stay here, live here, raise their families here. So it's extremely important to us. We participate in other ways in terms of helping small businesses to really get their, their feet on the ground. We have an incubator um, that where we have young companies, if you will, have an opportunity to have an office and resources here on our campus. And so as they're thinking about their ideas for new businesses, they're working with our faculty and our students, and it's a great, great way um, to really see the um, educational process in play and the way in which it affects the economy here in the um, uh, Commonwealth. And I'll just com conclude by saying that uh, when I was being hired now almost six years ago as president of the institution, I asked our students what is it that they wanted the, the president to know. First, they wanted a president who would show up uh, at places that they, where they are, so you'll see me at games and events. But they wanted the city of York and York County to be their hometown away from home. And we have really worked over the years to make that happen, so you will see them in a variety of venues. And what I've always said about um, the relationship between York County and the college is that as the college goes, the county and the city go. And as the city and the county go, the college goes. So welcome, please, and uh, thank you for being here. And I hope that this, you will continue to come. You're always welcome at York College. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Gunter Smith. Uh, welcome to an informal hearing uh, for the York County Federal State Delegation of York County concerning the impacts of the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I'm going to first take an opportunity to thank Congressman Scott Perry, Congressman Lloyd Smucker, Senator Pat Toomey, and President Donald Trump for their leadership and affirmative action to pass the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. While I'm excited to hear from testifiers about the impacts on Pennsylvania, I want to take a moment and publicly thank them. Uh, before turning it over to Congressman Perry, who is on his way up, a little delay, um, and Bob D'Souza for some opening remarks, I need to take care of some disclaimers. First, if you could turn off your cell phones or put them on silence. This hearing is being recorded and streamed live, and then copies of the testimony are on the table to your right as you came in. Uh, the Independent Fiscal Office wasn't available to testify in person today, but they have submitted written testimony as well as cost the Council of State Taxation has also uh, given testimony as well. Um, with that, uh, we'll start with, uh, unfortunately, Senator Toomey couldn't be with us today. Uh, he is dil diligently working in Washington, D.C., as the, probably the nation has uh, known they canceled their summer recess. Uh, but thankfully, we have a great man, um, Bob D'Souza, his state director, joining us this afternoon. Please pass our heart, our thank you. You can just stand and use thank that. Thank you, mic. Representative. Uh, I bring you greetings on behalf of Senator Toomey. Uh, he's very happy to see that you're holding this uh, session. As you know, Senator Toomey 
uh, was the prime author of this, uh, of this bill. And uh, he was very also grateful for your support and the members of the General Assembly who supported this effort when so many were worried about the effects of, of reducing state tax deductions that uh, many of you bravely stood out to understand the broader goals here. Uh, the tax reform uh, had two major components, the business component and the individual component. Its purpose was to make the United States the best place in the world to invest and to ensure that American companies and workers can complete, compete on a level playing field. By bringing down the corporate rate to 21 percent in line with our competitors, the trends of companies moving headquarters overseas ceased and they started bringing them back here to the United States. The in international reforms that this code uh, provided have led to a record number of dividends from abroad being brought back into the United States in excess of $350 billion. Allowing companies to have an immediate write-off of the cost of capital has already seen a great growth in their purchasability and their ability to hire new uh, employees. The, the relief to family-owned and small business has come th through targeted deductions and the CBO has put our growth uh, uh, at 3.3 percent for 2018, where previously it was estimated at 2 percent. So we see already, and it will be very interesting to hear from the, the people that you've brought uh, today, the effects on the business world, but what we can see is a booming economy and that uh, the effects are starting to take place. As to individual taxpayers, lower tax rates at every income level, doubling the standard deduction, doubling the child credit, and our estimate is that with Pennsylvania families with incomes of between Fifty and seventy thousand dollars each would see an average cut, tax cut of one thousand four hundred twenty-seven dollars. So uh, we're very, on behalf of Senator Toomey, very glad to have been able to be invited here to listen to this hearing and to hear from the uh, residents of the Greater York area and the businessmen on how this is affecting them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And please uh, pass our, our regards to the uh, senator a as pleasure. well. Pleasure. Yeah. And now I see the, the uh, our member of Congress has arrived. So yep. my stalling is done. <laughs> Uh, any any opening remarks, Congressman Perry? And obviously, thank you for uh, your work to pass this uh, uh, amazing law. So, you want me to? You can sit up here. Okay. Yes, sir. Here. The the product that that we that we got through the legislature on both sides we those of us who who knew that uh, and I just checked today by the way uh, you can check this on your own phone you can just download a free app it's called GDP now it looks like this when you open it up currently it's the Atlanta Fed this is not Scott Perry making this up this is the Atlanta Fed at this moment 4.6 up from 4.3 as of August 16th. We knew and we've had the strongest feeling that we needed to unleash the American economy because we were taking too much out of it at the federal level. But it's particularly for a certain faction of the House, we were concerned about the spending. And we didn't want to blow up the budget. And so we went with a proposal to the Budget Committee and the Tax Committee uh, to, to, uh, to cut about 800 uh, yeah, no, 80, 80 billion dollars. No, I'm sorry, 800 billion dollars over the 10-year term. Uh, we negotiated to 400, which is what we passed out of the House. And then, of course, the Senate added a trillion. They negated the 400 and added a trillion. Now, I will tell you this: um, uh, the federal revenues are actually up right now because there were a lot of a lot of criticism saying that if you if reduce uh, the tax rates and so on and so forth, you're going to blow this big hole in the budget. Federal revenue is actually up due to economic activity. But what is also up is federal spending. And unless we're going to get a handle on that, there's almost nothing we can do to fix our situation. Now, economic growth is incredibly important to the equation on every level. But at the same time, uh, economic growth is occurring and we're reaping the rewards from that, you also, also see the interest creeping up. And with the debt, and the deficit that we have, we have to pay interest payments on that, and that's going to become a major factor as the economy improves, which should, I hope, spur Congress on to do even more from the uh, tightening, tightening our belt and making some tough, tough decisions standpoint. We are looking towards uh, tax 
uh, Reform 2.0, potentially next month, which is making these, uh, these tax rates permanent and doing some other tweaking around the edges. But in a general sense, I think you can see the economic impact of, of this tax bill based on everything, every leading economic indicator from consumer confidence, which I think is at an 18-year high right now, to the unemployment figures, to, um, to wage, wage growth, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So we think we're on the right track from the tax standpoint. It's not enough from my viewpoint. We didn't, we didn't, take, we, we, we didn't take enough uh, out of the federal situation where we could leave people with more of what they earned, but it was a good, it was a good first start and something that we could actually get passed in the House and the Senate, which is, is no mean feat in Washington, D.C. It's 30 years, 30 years on since we've done this, so we feel like we're on the right track on the taxation side. We can tweak and do a little better. What we absolutely must, I think, address is the spending side, and I think that's pretty clear at this point. So I'm just really interested in hearing everybody's input to, to see if it validates what we feel like we've done from Washington, D.C. standpoint, and I appreciate the privilege of, of attending. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you again, Congressman. I know uh, from, from our, our revenue standpoint, the tax cuts have been uh, uh, a great incentive, and our appropriations chairman is sitting here. I think he'll agree that revenues are, are looking pretty good in Pennsylvania, I think, to some federal action. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, with that, we're going to ask our first set of panelists to come to the table as we do member introduction. We can start with to our right with uh, Representative Kiefer. I'm Represent Representative Dawn Kiefer. I'm in the 92nd Legislative District, which is Northern York County, and I'm part of Cumberland County. Representative Frank Ryan, 101st District, Lebanon County, PA. Kristen Phillips Hill, I have the honor of representing the 93rd Legislative District in Southern York County. State Representative Seth Grove, 196th District, York County. Representative Stan Saylor, 94th District of York County and Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. Rick Saccone, representing the 39th District, which is Southern Allegheny and Northern Washington Counties. Representative Kate Clunk, I represent the 169th District in the southwestern corner of York County. Good afternoon, everyone. Representative Dan Mal from Adams County, right next door. You didn't do your full introduction, Representative Mal. Yeah, we're the. Uh... <laughs> I always look forward to it. Uh, our, our first uh, panelists are giving an economic overview of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Jared Walzak, is that right? Uh, senior Policy Analyst of the Tax Foundation, Foundation Nathan Benefield, Vice President of the Commonwealth Foundation, and Commissioner Norman Kennard of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. Uh, Jared, would you like to start? Here we go. Um, Congressman Perry, Representative Grove, and members of the delegation, it's a privilege to be here today to speak to you about some of the economic effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and what you can expect and perhaps some follow-up measures that states themselves are taking. It's always good to be back in Pennsylvania. I am a Pennsylvania native, so this is probably the only state where my name will be pronounced correctly at least half the time. I do appreciate that. Uh, coming from the western part of the state, people get it here, they don't elsewhere. Uh, I am a senior policy analyst at the Tax Foundation, and we've worked extensively at both the federal level on this legislation and then at the state level working with states as they figure out how to do tax conformity and what the next steps are or even just understanding the implications. So I want to address a few of those very briefly. Firstly, just speaking to the broad economic effects of the bill. Obviously, there were some very clear intentions of this legislation, in some ways uh, fixing challenges that were created in 1986 and others trying to address problems that have existed in the tax code for much longer than that, where we had some disincentives for economic investment, where we had disincentives for remaining located in this country and trying to reverse some of those. So we have obvious provisions which promote investment uh, domestically particularly. So we have the changes on expensing, where we used to have bonus depreciation for certain classes of property. Now you have that full first year expensing that you can you know, write down the cost in the first year for acquisitions of uh, 
you know, business equipment and machinery. And this is important because this is how a corporate income tax is supposed to operate. It's supposed to be on your actual profits, essentially. It's not supposed to be on all of your input costs. But the depreciation schedules that businesses have historically used under our corporate income tax for most of its history have not taken that into account. And we've been somewhat of an outlier treated this. So that is a real improvement that makes it a little more affordable to invest in this country. Uh, we also see changes in the international tax regime, which make it more sensible for a business to remain located in the United States, to be headquartered here. Uh, so you would presumably see fewer inversions under the new law because of the shift from a worldwide or a global system of taxation where all income, wherever earned, is subject to U.S. corporate income taxes, less a credit for taxes paid to other countries and other jurisdictions, to a territorial system where at least theoretically you pay where you earn. Now, there's a lot of safeguards there. We have things called the base erosion anti-abuse tax, which is meant to avoid some profit shifting. Um, uh, we have uh, the uh, tax on global intangible low taxed income. There are other provisions that limit this. It's not a perhaps a pure territorial system, but what it is doing is saying, if you're a multinational that has facilities across the world, we are no longer going to give you the incentive to locate all of your business overseas to avoid U.S. taxes. Now you can have all those locations be still headquartered here, have a significant operation here, and uh, have a perhaps more favorable tax environment. Um, so that, I think, is very important. It does increase also the salience of state and local taxes, which has been a very controversial provision in some respects, but to me is also a sensible one. Uh, every state makes its own determination of what level of taxation its citizens require and the services they want to receive that those taxes are paying for. And it hasn't made a whole lot of sense that historically taxpayers across the country have subsidized so much of that and taken some of the tax cost away from those receiving the benefits and dispersed them across the rest of the country. Now that is significantly more localized with the state and local tax deduction being capped at $10,000. You see some things that maybe I wouldn't be as uh, pleased about. There's really an opportunity to do some additional tax planning around the new Section 198, 9A, which is the pass-through deduction. I think good intentions there, but it is a provision that enables some people uh, to recharacterize activity they were undertaking anyways that previously would have been wage income and recharacterize it as pass-through income or to get a differential rate uh, based on characteristics that economically are functionally identical. Uh, there are, again, anti-abuse provisions here as well, but I anticipate that in coming years we will see a lot of uh, creative accounting and creative ways to address this, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that needs to be revisited at some point in the future. But it does mean probably in the short term that you're going to see more pass-through businesses, not necessarily more employer pass-through businesses, but more individuals who are characterizing themselves as, uh, you know, as self-employed uh, rather than as wage earners. Uh, you are going to see um, some higher wages over time. We have some projections I'll share in a moment. Um, a lot of these will be backloaded because the reason for higher wages is primarily going to be due to lowering the cost of capital. And that takes time. Lowering the cost of capital doesn't mean that tomorrow everyone is going to have new investments online. These will take several years. So we would expect to see some wage effects, which I think is very important given that we've been in a period of decades of wage stagnation in this country. We have seen gains in pretty much every economic indicator other than wages. So this is important, but it's probably a few years out. The reduction in the corporate income tax rate you know, changes that tax wedge. It means that more investments that wouldn't have been profitable previously suddenly are marginally profitable, and you can bring those online. That is going to put more pressure on the labor market. It's going to be a tighter market. That means um, ultimately wage increases. You're also going to see um, investments suddenly, be, um, you know, money shift towards more profitable investments. We've seen a lot of consternation in the media recently about the stock buyback issue, because I think a lot of people look at this and say, we thought regular people were going to get a tax break. Isn't this just companies buying it back up? Or isn't it just the companies taking their earnings and taking their profits and not doing anything with it. I think in a large way, that's the wrong way to look at this. This is a reallocation of those resources. This is taking cash that has been sitting in accounts and not being used and actually putting it somewhere where there is a reinvestment opportunity. And that's what we want. We want cash to be reinvested. We haven't had a cash shortage for companies. Um, you know, U.S. 
companies have had plenty of access to credit. They've been sitting on significant reserves in many cases. It wasn't that tax reform was putting money in their pockets they could invest. It was that it was making more investments worth pursuing. And I think that's what we're starting to see. We're seeing those reallocations. That's really important. So wages will probably see start moving in a couple of years more than now, although there's some anticipatory changes already happening. But we'll see a front loading of the investments. The investments will happen more now than they will in the future. Partially, that's because there have been investments that have been waiting for a long time and they're now for viable for the first time. They're going to jump on it. Partially, it's because of the way that the tax reform is structured, where there are a lot of sunsets. And a lot of the provisions that encourage capital investment will only last until 2026. So there's a huge incentive to get a jump on them right now. Uh, this is good in a way, but it also means that you can't necessarily take a, a an investment growth rate for this year or next year and assume that this would be the rate in perpetuity. We would expect there to be a drop after 2026. If there is an extension, which I hope there would be, then you would expect a smoothing effect at some point. It's being front loaded at the moment. Uh, there, are, Let me briefly share some numbers, and I'll try to you know, keep this very brief. But um, there was a reference, I think, uh, Congressman, Perry referenced uh, one of the numbers that we ran in our model about um, what the average tax cut would be in um, Pennsylvania. So we looked at different income ranges. Uh, if you are between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars in uh, household income, you could expect an average tax cut of one thousand four hundred twenty-seven dollars a year under the TCJA. If you are in the seventy-five to one hundred thousand range, it's almost two thousand. It's one thousand nine hundred fifty-three dollars. Or if you're lower than that, twenty-five to fifty thousand, it's an eight hundred seventeen dollar tax cut. Uh, this is, I think, pretty substantial across the board. This is meaningful tax relief for the vast majority of Pennsylvanians. And you know, you'll see perhaps news articles, especially less so here than in other states, but you see a lot about the state and local tax deduction. And I think that in parts of this state, that's more significant than in others. The reality is that even individuals who may lose on that provision are generally gaining overall. This was a trade. You, know, you lose some of your deductions, or at least you lose value in those deductions, but you have lower marginal rates. You have different tax incentives than you used to have. I think better incentivization towards actual investment in this economy. So if you actually run the numbers, you'll find that even if someone has a smaller deduction, they usually also are facing lower rates. That means they have lower overall tax liability. So I think that's sometimes a canard that needs to be addressed. Uh, distributionally, through 2025, every income range is seeing a meaningful increase in their after-tax income. You know, if you're at 20 to 40 percent, um, you know, ranges, you're looking at about a 1 percent increase. If you're at, say, 60 to 80, it's a 1.4 percent increase. Everyone is seeing an increase in their after-tax income. That does not hold after the expiration of the individual provisions. If those are allowed to expire, then we would see some people worse off. So I think that is a really important motivation for Congress to find a way to extend those individual provisions. Um, but right now, at least, uh, we see these positive effects for the vast majority of individuals, and we expect good economic effect. When we look at 2025, we think that um, you, know, you should be seeing um, GDP about 3% uh, higher, you know, um, GDP growth about 3% higher than it would have been otherwise, wages about 1.7% higher than they would have been otherwise, and capital stocks where it really jumps 6.4% uh, higher than it would have been um, absent uh, federal tax reform. Now, these are all sort of in a vacuum. It's the old status quo, versus tax reform. Other things can happen too. We're kind of in a trade war right now, and uh, we've done some modeling of that. And unfortunately, if this continues, it could offset many, if not all, of the economic benefits of tax reform. Um, if all of the proposed tariffs on both sides went into effect right now, it would actually completely swamp it. You would be in a negative position with the two combined. So I think this is a uh, worrying development that will probably need to be addressed. But you know, on its own, yeah, the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act certainly does grow the economy. Uh, Pennsylvania doesn't have nearly as many interactions with the TCJA as most states because you go your own way on taxes largely, especially on the individual income tax side. You don't have the standard deduction. You don't have the personal exemption. Um, you don't really you don't have itemization in the way that other states do. So there's very few provisions that matter. There's a couple that do. They're mainly on the business side. So you go your own way on NOLs as well. Um, I think that's an area where you probably shouldn't be going your own way, or at least shouldn't be going the way you do. The Nextel case has been a big deal here for a long time. But as states move on the investment side 
of tax reform. They're going to be taking advantage of opportunities Pennsylvania doesn't have uh, because NOLs are still very restrictive here and they're capped and uh, you don't have full expensing. In fact, you narrowly dodged a bullet legislatively this year where you would have had the least um, favorable environment for investment in the country by a huge margin um, where that old three-sevenths rule would have backfired on you and meant that Pennsylvania would be the only state where you couldn't even take depreciation until disposing of an asset, if at all. That would have been extremely detrimental to the state. But even where you are now, you're basically on the old maker system and no one else. Like that's, that's not where people largely are now. Um, most states are at least makers plus. Some states will probably this year be at the old 50%. Um, you know, they'll basically continue with uh, bonus depreciation. And then some of your peers are actually going to be at full expensing, which Pennsylvania was briefly at 2011, but not long enough to do anything with. Uh, that's going to be a challenging place to be if you are so far behind on that and NOL. So I think those are areas where the state probably needs to take a close look. Um, there are some revenue increases for the state associated with federal tax reform, mainly because there are some corporate-based broadening provisions you adopt automatically. The interest limitation, uh, which makes sense as a policy. Uh, this, the desire here was to avoid the preference that has historically been given in the tax code for um, debt financing over equity financing and to treat them about equally. But there's an offset in the federal tax code and that's full expensing. So you're adding the cost on one side and you're not offsetting it on the other. I think that's a, an issue that will have to be addressed. Um, section 179, uh, the uh, small business expensing, you do conform on. That's good. That's a minor cost, but it's a good thing. I'm glad that the state is doing that. Um, uh, section 199, the old 199, is your, uh, your um, manufacturing deduction, and that goes away at the federal level and at the state level. I think that's good. I don't think that the manufacturing deduction was particularly good policy, but it's a revenue increase that is not being offset anywhere else in the system, so I draw your attention to it. And then you're just going to see some timing effects. Like I said, there's a lot of investment that's going to take place in the first couple of years, and there's some revenue associated with that. That may not last forever, uh, but you are going to see some revenue driven to the state simply by that. And budgeting that wisely is probably important because that is short-term revenue. It's not one year, but it's also not 10-year revenue. So maybe not treating that as the new baseline forever, especially if you don't adopt other provisions that piggyback on federal reform, though I think there's a real opportunity to do so in the coming years. Thanks. Uh, I, for those who don't know me, I'm Nate Benefield with the Commonwealth Foundation. Um, just want to talk briefly about, about some of the trends we have seen in, in Pennsylvania already uh, from, from tax reform. And, uh, and I will emphasize already because, you know, a tremendous, huge policy shift like this um, usually takes years to actually see the um, take effect in the economy. Um, but we already have seen some, some early benefits from this and some early uh, changes in, in behavior. Uh, the first area is, uh, I think very much as, as Jared already mentioned, that almost everyone will pay lower taxes and have greater take-home pay. Uh, and uh, I won't get into the, the tax foundation numbers that, that Jared already alluded to, but there are very similar numbers from other organizations. Uh, the Heritage Foundation estimated that the average Pennsylvania taxpayer um, will take home an average tax cut of more than $1,000 this year. Um, that's across the state. Um, the the left-leaning tax uh, policy center, uh, they estimated that uh, between 60 and 76 percent of, of households nationally will receive tax cuts, uh, with only 7 percent uh, receiving higher taxes. Uh, I want to really emphasize this point because I don't know that's the public perception out there for everyone. Um, I have seen polling that asked about the you know approval of, of the federal jobs uh, tax reform and the impact. Um, they actually asked people whether or not they had seen personally a, a tax reduction. Um, I can tell you that it is not accurate that, that 95 percent of Republicans and 10 percent of Democrats got a tax cut. Uh, that was not in the tax code. Uh, that is uh, simply uh, partisanship uh, affecting the, the poll results. Uh, the reality is that, that almost everyone receives, uh, receives a tax break. Uh, the independent fiscal office here did their own analysis and did a number of case studies looking at Pennsylvania families at, uh, at all income levels, looking at those filing single, uh, those filing mar you know, married, uh, looking whether they got their income through wages and salary alone or through investment income, um, and basically found that in almost every category uh, there was a, a tax reduction. Um, and that and includes those who weren't even paying taxes at all, that those individuals will actually be getting more back uh, from the federal government uh, this year from, from, from that. 
Uh, second area we, we've seen is that employers are already responding uh, by reinvesting in Pennsylvania, uh, doing um, bonuses, doing uh, new investment, increasing benefits, uh, and even raising wages. Uh, and we've seen this from some of our largest employers in the state uh, and biggest companies from Comcast uh, out in Philadelphia, uh, which uh, plans to spend $50 billion in new investment in the next five years. Uh, and out in Pittsburgh, uh, PNC Bank, uh, they have increased the wages for employees, uh, issued bonuses, increased retirement benefits, uh, and plan to put another $200 million into charitable contributions. Um, some local examples um, in, the, in the region, uh, Fulton Bank, uh, which is based in Lancaster but has offices in New York, uh, they raised their minimum starting wage uh, and increased the time off they offered. Uh, Centric Bank uh, in Harrisburg uh, just this, this, this month uh, announced that they are increasing salaries for entry-level personnel uh, and, and for salaries for those who are kind of near that entry-level uh, wage uh, and putting another three to four million dollars in additional investments uh, in, into, their, into their capital. Uh, and this certainly affects national companies that have em employers, employees in the area. Um, companies like Lowe's and Home Depot, um, AT&T and Apple uh, were among those who gave bonuses uh, as a result of the tax reform. Uh, McDonald's recently raised their tuition incentive uh, to pay for more tuition uh, for, for employees. Uh, and companies like Starbucks and Walmart and Wells Fargo were among those who raised their wages. Uh, I really want to you know, point out the wages. There's a lot of emphasis uh, people talking about the bonuses that were issued, uh, but the f companies are raising their wages as a result of uh, tax reform really kind of counters a, a myth that we hear that the, the government needs to raise the minimum wage and tell employers they have to pay more. Um, the reality is if you let companies keep more of their money, they will, they will reward their workers and pay them higher wages, and that's, that's the benefit you see from having a, a more competitive tax, tax code. Um, the third area, and I'm going to spend less time on this because I know the next festival will speak to this, but um, consumers are paying less in utility costs. Um, from your water, your, your electric bill, to your heating bill, um, the tax reform pack, package will save consumers in Pennsylvania about $400 million annually uh, versus lower, uh, via lower, lower utility bills. Uh, and the last area is how it benefits the state finances. Uh, the Independent Fiscal Office estimates that there will be about 6 to $7 billion injected into Pennsylvania's economy as a result of tax reform. Um, this adds to our, our jobs picture. Um, you've seen job growth, seen lower unemployment rates, uh, and I will cite Governor Tom Wolf, who I will remind people uh, sent a letter opposing tax reform. I think uh, Congressman Perry probably has this letter saying, please don't vote for this tax reform. People are going to die. Uh, he actually celebrated the impact, uh, tweeting that unemployment is p in Pennsylvania has dropped to the lowest rate since 2007, with the number of jobs in Pennsylvania at a record high. Opportunities for workers and businesses are growing every day. Uh, that, was, that was a week ago, uh, government was celebrating basically the impact and the, the economic growth that, that we've seen o over the last, uh, last few months and last years. Now that doesn't change the fact that Pennsylvania is, is still lagging the nation in economic growth, uh, that we have a higher unemployment than the rest of the nation, uh, that we've been typically in the bottom in terms of job growth and, and economic growth, uh, and have a lot of uh, work to do uh, on that front, uh, but it certainly does show that the economic benefits and the economic growth that has happened nationally is, is happening here in Pennsylvania as well. Uh, a, a byproduct of that economic growth is increased state revenue. Um, the Independent Fiscal Office estimates that, that this year um, state tax revenues will increase by about $260 million. Uh, I know that's a, a big relief to balancing our budget. Uh, that's a good explanation of why we're here in August having this hearing rather than talking about why we have a budget impasse that's lasting several months again uh, for the you know, governor demanding more taxes. Um, this impact has, has really helped um, alleviate the, the concerns at the, at the state level. Um, and that is why Pennsylvania, and, and talking to certainly state lawmakers here, uh, should, should follow suit and take uh, this, this lesson uh, into adopting better state tax policy. Um, one area would be to look at our overall tax burden, reducing that, uh, showing that there are benefits to, to having lower taxes, making Pennsylvania more competitive, uh, attracting job creators, attack, attracting families, uh, and reversing the trend where we've been, been near the bottom. A big area is our business tax structure, uh, where we have one of the highest corporate income tax rates in the country uh, at 9.99%, uh, which drives businesses to other states and overseas. S some good news on that front, uh, New Jersey decided to raise their corporate income tax rate, so they are now higher than Pennsylvania uh, and will be driving their businesses in, into uh, across the Delaware River here to Pennsylvania. 
Um, but we are still among the least competitive states in the country uh, in, in that regard uh, and are competing certainly with every state and, and certainly internationally for, for companies uh, to invest in Pennsylvania. Uh, and have typically done so using a lot of corporate welfare incentives uh, instead of lowering the tax burden on, on all businesses and all employers. Uh, and finally, um, to, to be able to um, do this is, is controlling the growth of state spending. Uh, and I know uh, one of the best ways to do that is adopt the Taxpayer Protection Act. Uh, I know the House passed that earlier uh, this year, maybe it was late last year, I guess it was passed out of the House, uh, which would limit the growth of state spending to inflation and population growth. Uh, allowing families to keep more of their own money, uh, allowing businesses to keep more of their own money uh, and invest that in, in Pennsylvania uh, rather than having going to government. Uh, and, and that is, uh, I think, the lesson learned that uh, tax reform has many benefits for Pennsylvania and we should uh, adopt that here at the state level. Good afternoon. Representative Grove, members, congressmen, thank you for asking the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission to today to talk about the tax impact. I'm going to walk it back from the from the masterful macro view that you've just received from these two gentlemen and talk about the, the, our world of, of public utilities. Um, I have prepared testimony. I won't be reading it. You're welcome. But I do want to note on page on page three of the testimony, um, there is the rate formula set forth and you can see taxes are an express component of the means by which we set rates and regulate utilities in the state. You'll notice that the T factor, taxes, is an express component of the calculation. If taxes rise, rates go up. If taxes go down, rates go down. So without diving deeply into the, into the formula and the process, there is a 200-page book if you want to del delve into it in a little more detail or suffer. <laughs> This is yours, <laughs> and we have, we have more for anybody else that wants one. Um, but from a utility uh, perspective, this has been a true success story. It's probably the most um, obvious, transparent, mathematical um, demonstration of, of uh, trickle down there is. We are returning, utilities are returning $420 million per year Back to, their, back to their customers. Since June, bills have started to appear. Here's one for MedEd. It is a $2.62 credit on an $80 bill. Here's another one that is a $2.79 credit on a $100 bill. So these, these are f benefits are flowing directly, directly through to the, to the customers. Um, there are additional cases in process, which will add to that number. I can't say how high, but there is at least five companies, including York Water and Columbia Gas, who serve the York County area, they're in the midst of rate cases, and those rate cases will be uh, lower because of the, of the Tax Act. So um, from the beginning, the Commission's charge was clear. We operate under the code that you have all passed, and it's our obligation to set rates that are just and reasonable, and just and reasonable does not include taxes that exceed the, the actual expense. And we frequently don't um, regulate rates on a uh, uh, single change, but this one was so huge and, 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 and so large in its dollar impact that we felt that we had to readjust the rates to accommodate and recognize what happened with the, uh, with the Tax Act. It was a little complicated for the companies um, and, and the commission, the calculation, because it was more than just a simple decrease of the statutory rate from 35% down to 21%. The, the act also uh, affected uh, the tax repair, bonus depreciation, and the, cal and the accumulated reserve uh, taxes that are included in our rate making process. So obviously the utilities that we regulate are monstrously capital intensive deferred depreciation, accelerated depreciation, the repair bonus, all make major, uh, have major impacts on them, and, it's, and, it can, and it can be different. If you look at the attachment to my testimony, I think one company is returning in excess of 8%. Another one actually had a little bit of an increase, not much. So it wasn't a uniform um, change because the statutory rate changed. Once you factored in the, the changes in depreciation, it was, it was, uh, it was, a, little bit, uh, it was a little bit mixed. So for those in uh, York County, uh, Metropolitan Edison is for the most part your electric company. They're gonna be returning $37 million back to customers, an average deduction of 8.5% on the distribution portion of that bill. That's huge. That's, 
Columbia Gas and New York Waters, I mentioned, are in the middle of rate cases, but they're going to have sizable uh, changes as, as well. So that's the plan that we're going to remain, that's the plan that's going to remain in, in place, uh, at least until, the, until circumstances change. These refunds and credit will be continuing. As we mentioned, it's an annual amount. So this is an ongoing benefit to the customers of Pennsylvania. Um, some other states have acted to reduce rates, but a lot of them have not. So I'm very proud of our commission and our companies for stepping forward and saying we need to do something. We need to return this back to, back to uh, customers. So that, in a nutshell, is the utility impact of the, uh, of the, of the Tax Act. And uh, I have Representative Groh's permission to do a little info, infomercial here on, on broadband. So um, the Center for Rural Pennsylvania has hired a, a professor from Penn State to try to analyze the availability of broadband telecommunications service in Pennsylvania through a crowdsourcing mechanism, which is really interesting because to date we rely upon reports filed by the carriers with the FCC. Um, so it's carrier-driven data. It is also I think at fault because it breaks it down into census blocks. And if there's one customer that has broadband in that census block, the whole the whole census block is deemed to have that. Well, that you, you know that's not true. You instinctively know that's not true. There's going to be a the, the the hole in the donut may have service the town, but the surrounding donut is not necessarily going to have going to have broadband. So the brilliance of this approach is to basically I call it crowdsourcing. So I'm going to give you the the address. Um, on the internet, but what they're asking people to do is actually dial up this website and take the test. You will see immediately what your broadband speed is, which is good for you to know, but more importantly, the information is being recorded, and, and so the data will then be compiled into a map of broadband availability in Pennsylvania. So we're very excited about this and happy to team up with the center to, to start to advertise this. So. That's the end of my infomercial representative, but I do, I'm going to hand out the Pennsylvania broadband map based upon the data we have, as well as the, the local counties um, broken down. And the site to go to is broadbandtest.us, and it will be immensely helpful to, to your constituents and this whole process if you would start to advertise this as well. I just, as we were thinking about this, you, you guys do newsletters, it would be a perfect vehicle for you to advertise this to your, to your constituents and so we can get the, the million or better hits that, we, that we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate your testimony. Um, first up, uh, Representative Frank Ryan. Yeah, Commissioner, first of all, th and gentlemen, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, the formula, you just made my day, so thank you. Oh, awesome. Uh, question is- There's more in the book. I, I, would, I can't wait to, is there a video <laughs> on it by any chance? The movie's the, uh, coming out, right? right. It's, it's very sad, isn't it? <laughs> uh, in terms of the rate decrease that took place as a result of the Tax Cut Act, uh, subsequent to that, Pennsylvania recently passed Act 72, which was put us in the maker's uh, consideration relative to depreciation. We were disadvantaged prior to that. Does the rate decrease application that you're showing in your appendix also appendice also include the change in the state tax law? It does not. Do they? Do we need to redo that? I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. I'll look into that. So I'm not sure what this, what the impact is dollar wise, but it's pretty significant. Okay. But with a marginal tax rate of nine point, well, a total tax rate nine point nine nine. It's a fairly effective tax rate in the Commonwealth. And Representative Grove, I'd recommend you, if you reissue your letter as you did before that we all signed on to, and I would be happy to sign on to it. Representative Hill. Thank you, Representative Grove. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we know that federal tax cuts are working for Pennsylvanians, uh, but that we also need substantial uh, tax cuts here in the Commonwealth, as well as the great work that's been done um, with the federal regulatory system and reform. Um, and it's really given us a robust national economy and that our finalized state budget that included no new tax increases uh, or no f new fees on, on our taxpayers um, and the opportunity for us to put record investments in some key areas would not have happened had it not been for that action at the federal government. So uh, to Senator Toomey, thank you. To Congressman Perry, we, we thank you. Um, Commissioner Kennard, uh, thank you. Because um, 
I've worked very hard on regulatory reform as well as um, creating a much better uh, system of um, internet coverage across the entire Commonwealth. And this is uh, so essential, what you have put forward today. Um, is there anything else that we need to do in the Commonwealth? Because we know that the tax cuts need to happen here in Pennsylvania, right. um, that regulatory reform needs to happen here in Pennsylvania, and, and there's going to be the need for regulatory reform to assure that private sector companies come in and invest right. in covering every part of Pennsylvania, those 800,000 people who don't have access to high-speed internet with that essential economic tool. Um, my concern with what's happening here is that uh, for large parts of Southern New York County, um, they're not even going to be able to get on the internet to let you know what their speed is. So um, how is that going to work? And I, how I, are we going to take that information and move it forward? Well, first off, thank you. I know you're, I know you're all in on this issue as a founding member of the House uh, Broadband Caucus, as well as congratulations on your recent appointment to the FCC Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, and um, we continue to work closely to try to bring broadband to Pennsylvania. My understanding is it's the, it's the areas that don't have data that will be then become focus. So it's like the shadow. So it, it, it's almost a reverse. By crowdsourcing it, it almost makes it the reverse. If there is no data or the data is very slow and you suspect, you know, it, it, and so there's, it's going to be a deductive process. It's not going to be the carrier saying, yes, we provide it here. It's going to be, here's the speeds and, oh, here's no data. And overlaid, I think, across the um, carrier information is going to be where the, where the conclusions we need to double down and, and dig in deeper to, to um, get, to the, get to the bottom of it. In terms of what the commission's doing right now, um, we are reforming regulations for our carriers. We have a, a, a generic investigation and rulemaking ongoing to try to reduce the level of regulations on our carriers free, to free them up. Um, we are also uh, just unanimously as a commission adopted a, a motion to look into how to, how to more effectively um, manage the telecommunication space on telephone and electric poles. So there's a three foot space I know you've, most people have never looked at their tele their at their polls, but you start to look at them and they get kind of they get interesting. So there's a three foot space for communications, and oftentimes that's crowded. It gets it's expensive to get up there. There are rules by the FCC, but they're they're not necessarily enforced. And what we're trying to, what we're offering to do as a commission is step forward, enforce those rules to get to allow carriers that are providing broadband to get on the polls more efficiently, effectively, and more and more timely. And that's, I'm sure there's more to do, but that's what we're focused on right now. Thank you. And uh, we stand ready to assist in any way that we can. Thank you. Representative Kiefer. So I have a question regarding, um, you were talking about, Nathan, um, cost controls, essentially. You said one of the ways to do that was the tax Taxpayer Protection Act. So as you know, this year, as we went through that, and trying to determine what Pennsylvania's um, was is that uh, there wasn't enough clarity maybe in, in the legislation that we passed out of the House because it got into um, whose rate of inflation and whose population growth. So you would think common sense would tell you Pennsylvania's rate of inflation because ours is drastically different than the national's uh, rates. And then also, um, what's, who determines that? So we were looking at the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, which takes the three-year average. But then um, as we were going back and forth in negotiations, they started taking the one-year average. So uh, you know, we saw a rate of inflation of you know, 6 or 7%. So we're staying under that. So I think there definitely needs to be clarity there, because that can, again, be manipulated. In. So have you guys taken a look at that? Yeah, so in, in kind of what we have used at Commonwealth to calculate that uh, is we've used the, the We've used a three-year average, um, looking at the, the CPI um, overall, and using October to October. We use the October number because that is, you know, would give time for the budgeting process um, to, to take into that into account. Um, we do know that um, states that have had this have had, um, using inflation and population growth, have had much better restraint, um, much better effects than states that have used, for instance, keeping it personal income or some other measure like, like that. Um, in terms of the specifics, I would say I think we've, you know, what was passed uh, out of the House was a constitutional amendment um, version, which I think is the way to go because you 
want to have it in the Constitution, otherwise you can just repeal the law, and it's an ineffective limit to have. Um, uh, but there needs to be, I think, a statutory version that would come after that that would really specify what periods to use, uh, what measure to use, who determines that, uh, when is it determined, um, rather than kind of having it, well, let's look at the highest rate uh, or the highest number that comes up and use that, uh, which I think is the problem if you don't have that, that specificity uh, in the legislation. Thank you. Uh, Jared, yes. there's a chart out there that says wages have decreased. I think it's out by the, the U.S. Department of Labor. Have, are you familiar with that chart? Yeah, I, th I believe it's a uh, very short term. Like, I think it's an adjustment factor question issue, but yes. Okay. Slightly. Can you review why it's showing and reflecting that? Um, I'm not actually sure I can give you a great answer. I wish I had a colleague here who does more on the federal side, but um, my understanding is that largely these are like seasonal adjustment sort of issues. We would expect there to be modest dips. We have seen wages on the increase overall, um, and we will probably continue to do so. However, you should not expect significant wage effects from the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for probably another year or two. You'll see some, um, and we've seen some short-term changes. So. And there's been a lot of focus on bonuses. Um, bonuses were in some cases caused by the TCJA, but that doesn't give you a lot of confidence in and of itself that you're going to see higher compensation overall, and I think that can be overstated. Uh, we have seen in some industries certainly already upward pressure on wages, uh, but where it's really going to matter is going to be where you're seeing substantial investment, and that investment takes time to actually put into place. Um, and I just I don't know that you're going to see that for another year or two. I would also say there is a big countervailing factor right now, and that is, again, that we are in the early stages of a trade war and that this, unfortunately, is going to affect a lot of jobs in secondary manufacturing. It has this very narrowly targeted focus on like raw materials manufacturing. Maybe you save a handful of jobs there, but you look at a state like well, you look at Pennsylvania and you say, okay, yes, you have U.S. Steel, you have some companies that are making steel, and you know, maybe you can make the case that some jobs are protected there, although it's very doubtful. You have so many more jobs that use steel that now can't afford it or can't afford to produce at the same levels as they could. And I think you're going to see some wage rate depression. I don't know if that's a reason for the current numbers, which I think are largely a blip, but... I do think you're going to be depressing the wage rate if we continue to impose tariffs at the rate we're doing right now. Okay. Second question, the IRS recently came out with a ruling about workaround salt yes. deductions. Um, uh, two probably main theories of doing that. One is shifting over to a, I know New York did it, like an optional uh, payroll tax. The other was a set up a nonprofit yes. and having people donate. The IRS basically slapped and shut both of those options down, correct? That's correct. Okay, so they're not even an option for states moving forward. Yeah. Technically, they're not illegal, but what has happened is you have to reduce the amount of any charitable deduction you claim by any benefit you receive, including the benefit of a tax credit. This logic has always applied. You know, if you go to a benefit dinner and the ticket's 250 bucks, if the dinner has a fair market value of 50 bucks, you only get to claim 200. They're applying the same logic to tax credits and saying, if you made a contribution but you got an 85% tax credit, you can only actually deduct the residual 15%. That doesn't make the New York salt work around illegal, but precisely zero people would be inclined to take that because you would be losing money. You pay New York more and you get no federal benefit for doing so. Why would you do that? Okay. Thank you. So can I respond? Yeah. Um, there was some concern with, with that rule change how it would affect individual contributors to our um, EITC and OSTC programs that give through the, uh, the SPEs. Um, we did some analysis of, of that and looked at it. And uh, so for anyone who is over the SALT cap, um, there would be no, no difference. Um, it would have no impact on, on theirs. Um, for someone uh, who is under that, uh, if they gave $1,000 uh, under the current interpretation, uh, they would save about $920 uh, overall in taxes in state and local, uh, state and federal. Um, under the new rule, they would still get about a $700 overall tax reduction, uh, 900 from the state, and then um, federal offsetting because of the, the, the new rule change. But they would still get a significant overall tax reduction. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Appreciate the PUC. I know it's got to feel good to actually reduce rates. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. The best feeling. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have uh, a panel on taxpayers and job creators. Um, B. John Bailey, president of Bailey Coach. Uh, personally, just want to thank you for your work on veterans. Uh, you have one of the most generous businesses out there, and we, we as a community really appreciate what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's my pleasure. Can never do enough for the veterans, so. Uh, Tom Ryan, Chief Financial Officer, Motor Technology Incorporated. Carl Marrero, Vice President of Government Affairs, Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, and Nathaniel Fischel, CPA, uh, Smith Elliott, Carnes & Company, LLC. Gentlemen, thank you so much. And John, you want to start us off? Sure. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first and foremost, I'd just like to thank you for your service to our government. Uh, you are what make government run. Uh, although we may uh, shake our heads and scratch it from time to time, it, it does a pretty good job overall. Uh, my name is John Bailey. I own and operate Bailey Coach just a few miles from here in West York. Bailey Coach is a family-owned transportation company headquartered in West Manchester Township, York County, PA. Bailey Coach was founded by myself and my partner Rodney Seacrest, two local businessmen in 1998 with two motor coaches. The Bailey family's travel route stretched back to 1933 when my Uncle Glenn, a professor and teacher at York High, operated his first student group train trip to the Chicago World's Fair. When my father, Captain Fred J. Bailey, returned home after serving his country during World War II, they formed Bailey Travel Service in 1949. The Bailey family is in its 69th year of serving the travel needs of the residents of South Central Pennsylvania. The Bailey family has recently sold its travel agency division, Travel Time Travel, that had grown from the two Bailey brothers in 1949 to a sales volume of $38 million travel agency operation with offices in York and Lancaster counties and 36 full-time employees servicing clients throughout the world. Bailey Coach operates 30 vehicles sized from luxury sedans and vans, SUVs, shuttle buses, mini coaches, and full-size 55 passenger motor coaches. We proudly transport safely over 150,000 passengers a year in the eastern part of the USA and Canada. We focus mainly on transporting local college, very proud that we transport York College right here, and high school sports teams, educational field trips, the US military, Amtrak, and airline emergency transportation. We also are FEMA contractor for hurricane relief and other natural disasters of our motor coach division. The sedan and van division specializes in executive transportation to the region's airports from JFK to Reagan National, wedding and corporate shuttle transportation. The Bailey, Bailey family accompanies and employs 54 staff members from drivers to office to mechanical staff and wash bay personnel. We operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and are well known for our theme coaches. Our first one was a military uh, theme coach to honor the men and women in uniform that serve our great country. Our second one was a gold star coach to honor gold star families that made the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, our third one was a visit York County motor coach, and I just did statistics on that uh, today that they asked for, and that operated over a thousand hours in the last six months, transporting people throughout the eastern part of the United States. Um, and then our last one that we just did, uh, we did a, a rotary coach. I've been a Rotarian for almost 40 years, uh, and Rotary's commitment to eliminating polio to 99.9 percent .9 of the world we did a rotary theme coach, and we have a lot of fun with those. In the past 20 months, we have purchased new equipment to transport passengers in the amount of $1,160,000, and an additional investment of used equipment, uh, late model modern motor coaches, in the amount of $350,000, or total in $1.5 million. Without a strong economy, we would not have made this large of an investment in the new equipment we would have purchased late model used equipment. As we view the economy to remain strong due to tax cuts and the JOB Act, in October of this year, our family is purchasing a 13,000 square foot building in Jackson Township, York County, located on 4.3 acres of land near Nashville, Pennsylvania. It's completely renovating and expanding 
um, the footprint of the building to 15,000 square feet. Our financial commitment to purchase and renovate this building is an additional $1.5 million from the Bailey family. This facility will allow us to provide a better working environment for our staff, become more efficient, and to better serve the people of South Central Pennsylvania. Thank you. My name is Tom Ryan. Um, I'm the Chief Financial Officer with Motor Technology, which is located in Manchester, here in York. And thank you for the opportunity to share our experiences with you today. The, the long and short of it is a definite and emphatic yes, this has helped amazingly. Uh, both the company and equally importantly, more importantly, our employees. Uh, the company was founded by my father in 1980, so not quite as long and illustrious a career as, as John's business, but it's still a family-owned business also, although I sometimes think it owns us rather than we owning it. Uh, we, we also have three generations of the family now working, but in addition to that, we have grown to 94 employees as of 2017. Uh, at the beginning of 2018, 2018 due to the, the tax cuts, all of those employees immediately start taking home more money thanks to the increased standard deduction and the lower personal income taxes. Uh, that's not speculative, that's not a calculation. I see those paychecks. I know what they were taking home and it was a lot more and they knew it was a lot more and they appreciated it and they, they expressed themselves about it. Uh, moreover, since then, since the beginning of the year, due to the to corporate side of the tax cut, we have continued to increase wages faster than we had otherwise intended. Uh, and we've also added additional employees such that we're now at about 100 and we're still growing. Uh, our business is the repair of industrial electric motors. Every company has dozens if not thousands of electric motors, so it's, it's a good business. They run the pumps, the fans, the compressors, the cranes, the conveyors, the production equipment, the presses, you name it, uh, motors run it. Uh, motors are what keep industry running, motor technology keeps those motors running. Uh, and what that means is we are a service business. So we're only ever as good or as profitable as our employees. And that's why the employees are first and foremost and why those raises are there and going up as, as we move forward. We need well, employees who are well paid, motivated, and rewarded. It's smart business. It's not a matter of being magnanimous or socialist uh, or otherwise mystically enlightened. It's just good business uh, to reward your employees. And when we're able to do that, that's exactly what we do. Reemploying, reinvesting our employees is what keeps us growing. But that reinvestment also means training, not just wages. Because of the technical re skills required to repair industrial electric motors, our business has always been training intensive. That is even more true today because of watershed changes in our industry. Taking advantage of those changes requires even more workforce training and hiring, and also significantly new investments in capital, uh, new capital investments. The electric motor itself hasn't changed much in over a century. What has changed is how those motors are controlled electronically and how they are maintenanced and repaired and tweaked for maximum productivity and efficiency. And that is now taking a major leap forward with the advent of the Internet of Things and big data analytics. We used to walk around the plant and check each motor individually, decide maybe there was something wrong, maybe there wasn't. Sometimes they'd take it apart and all of a sudden there was something wrong that wasn't before. Uh, Nowadays, and this is where the Internet of Things and the, the big data analytics come in, we can put a sensor on that motor. Um, and that will monitor it constantly, not just once a week, once a month, once a year, but, or when it breaks down. Uh, it's there constantly, and it reports instantly if there's a potential problem. That enables timely repairs that avoid costly shutdowns and catastrophic failures, and it avoids lost production. I'm going to give you a concrete example from just this past summer, so again, to make it very, very real. Now, this involves amusement park rather than an industrial setting, but you'll see the applicability. It's a real story, uh, and it, it dramatizes a little bit more. We put a sensor on the electric motor that pulls the roller coaster up that enormous first hill at a local amusement park. Um, so right off, there's a safety advantage because now guys don't have to climb up and down eight stories every time they want to check on that motor. We can do it remotely with this little monitor. Uh, what happens is one afternoon that sensor calls us up. Literally, we get text messages. Uh, and it says, I'm probably going to break down sometime next week, likely in the middle of the day, with a full load of customers and kids probably about halfway up the hill. So why, why don't you come here tonight after we close and fix me now? <laughs> uh, there's more. That motor sensor says, it's my bearings that are going to fail. Bring along with you an ABC bearing and an XYZ bearing, the very specific type. All motors have individually specific bearings. It says what kind of bearings to bring along. So now we're prepared with the proper parts. It's going to go a lot quicker when we get down there that evening. But there's more. This is where the big data analytics kicked in. Uh, it's also diagnosed the root cause, 
that's, called, that's making those bearings fail. It's saying this motor's out of alignment. That's why the bearings are failing. Bring along your laser alignment equipment, line me up better, and we won't be having this problem again in another two weeks or two months. Uh, so that's where we are at this point. Uh, and it, it's a brand new area for us. As I said, we used to walk around checking on these things um, with our eyes, and my dad would put his hand on and feel them. And of course, he was very good. He's better than the machine, to be honest. He can still put his hand on the machine and tell you what's wrong with it uh, quicker than, than what the, 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 the equipment can. But it's the ways of the future. But the, the, to seize it, we need very large investments in training our technicians, hiring new personnel, and investing in very expensive equipment. And again, to make it very concrete, before I came out here this morning, we were looking at bids for $250,000 of new equipment in this area. Uh, so we can be moving into it. That's an immediate purchase we're going to be making here in the very short term. We're also looking at $850,000 of additional equipment to put these systems in various companies' plants around the, the area. Uh, so a very growth area. Um, and none of that would have happened, been possible, without these tax cuts. Um, you know, they freed up the funds for reinvestment, and the expensing provisions enable us to recoup those investments much more quickly than we other, otherwise would have been able to. So these are very concrete, real benefits of what's going on, not just in our industry, uh, but due to these tax cuts enabling us to take advantage of those changes. Uh, the other side of that equation are our customers. You know, it wouldn't be possible if there weren't demand from our customers, and that's a measure of how much better they're doing as well. Uh, and, and again, I can see it. I, can, I know what our billings are. I know what they're buying and what they're not buying. They're not saying we can wait to repair that or we don't want to consider, you know, this kind of predictive maintenance. Uh, you know, we'll continue to wait until things break. You know, they, they can invest proactively too. Uh, so we're seeing the benefit very much. And, and they attribute it also to the tax cuts um, and to the better environment as a whole. Uh, I, I, another, and it's, it's been alluded today here already, but I don't usually hear much about it, so I wanted to bring it up, and that's the electricity reduction. Uh, before I came out here this morning, I looked at our most recent electricity bill, and it was only for part of the month since that 8.5% um, reduction kicked in, but it saved us a couple hundred bucks. Uh, you know, each and every month, a couple hundred bucks adds up. For a little company, that's, what you, that's how you get by. But here's the other thing. An electric motor, electric motors as a whole, use up about 75% of this country's industrial electricity. That's where, that's where their money goes. So for them to have that kind of reduction is saving them thousands upon thousands of dollars a month. Again, a benefit we don't see. It's not headline kind of benefit, but the reduction we're seeing in Detroit is already there in the electricity. As I said, we just got our first bill. It hasn't yet hit our natural gas bill. We're expecting to see a smaller benefit there as well. Um, so what, what's next? If, if these trends continue, we'll continue adding to headcount and wages. Um, and yes, you can only move so fast on wages until you see where it's gone. So we, we've done the bonuses. Um, we've increased our 401k match. Uh, we have automatic enrollment. We've increased uh, the threshold where they get enrolled at, which we then match. Um, we have profit sharing also. Uh, and, and another area is, is health care premiums. And I guess that, that deserves being pointed out because they continue to skyrocket. Uh, Obamacare and all that, there's those of us who actually buy the insurance from, from insurance companies and whatnot. Uh, and it just it goes through the roof. And it, it's as good as fast as we grow. That grows faster. Uh, and that's the hidden, one of those hidden thieves from employees' wages because we keep pouring more money into their premiums. Well, they're not seeing it in their paycheck, and it's not showing up on the charts that you get from the economists very often uh, unless you really get the, the more, much more detailed ones. Uh, so that, that's another area that, you know, going forward, we would definitely put on the agenda. Um, another area on that agenda moving forward is workforce development. Uh, I've already noted that we invest a lot in training, and we need a lot to, to invest a lot more to stay healthy and growing. But the product we receive from the current educational system is woefully inadequate. Uh, we, we really need something done there. And what makes it galling is when we look at the property-based school taxes. Uh, our property taxes are as high as our Pennsylvania state income tax. Uh, uh, and that, that's one people don't much talk about. Uh, and you can know where that one's gone, and you know it isn't producing a good, good result. Uh, so it's something that hurts business but two ways. It's very expensive and it's not giving us the raw material we need to keep growing. Uh, so that's an area. Um, and, and then at the corporate, I've already mentioned the, the taxes at the corporate level, but the, the state tax, which also has been mentioned today, um, it's one of the highest in the country. Um, we, need, we need to match the state needs. We need to find ways to have the state match, um, be parallel to support what's going on now on the federal side. Um, 
so we need the state to get on board and, and that's you know hopefully what you guys can do and what with maybe a new governor we can do as well so summing up as I, as I said before my main purpose here today is to provide concrete adamant examples contrary to a lot of people's opinions feels that companies our size and type are eager to invest and to reinvest in our companies and our employees and that we can and do make constructive and productive use uh, of funds uh, when the government is in our pocket or in our way Great. Thank you, Representative Grove, Congressman Perry, and distinguished members of the York County Federal and State Delegation. Thank you for hosting this important hearing on the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act on the Pennsylvania economy. Um, I'm Carl Marrera, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. And while I will share um, our testimony aloud, I've also submitted a version that cites additional sources and provides some greater detail. Um, additionally, uh, we are submitting a letter from our friends at the Council on State Taxation, which you mentioned in Washington, D.C. They are true experts, and we value their insight as they shed light on two majorly intricate areas of needed reforms in Pennsylvania to best comply and make Pennsylvania economically competitive with the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. With that said, let's dive in. PMA is the century-old Nonprofit trade organization representing the people who make things here in our Commonwealth and manufacturing is the engine that drives Pennsylvania's economy, generating over $82 billion of value every year, directly employing over a half of a million Pennsylvanians on plant floors. And that core manufacturing activity sustains millions of additional jobs uh, that service the manufacturing industry. We all want it to be the smart business decision to invest, to hire, and to expand here in the United States rather than in one of our competitor countries. From that perspective, we enthusiastically thank Senator Toomey, Congressman Perry, and all the lawmakers that voted for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We are seeing enhanced productivity and we are witnessing growth and expansion here at home as trillions of dollars that were trapped overseas are coming back home because of provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So sincerely, thank you. It's working. By ending the duplicative nature of the way that the United States used to treat foreign earnings business capital coming home, in a recent Bloomberg analysis it was stated, um, before 2018, U.S. non-financial corporations tended to add about $50 billion to earnings held abroad every three months. But in the first three months of 2018, that number turned to a negative $158 billion, according to the Federal Reserve. That's the biggest reversal on records going back to 1946 and much more than companies brought back in 2005, the last time the government tried something similar. But that is that reinvestment coming to Pennsylvania? PMA's mission is to uh, is for state economic competitive. We want it to be the smart business decision to invest, hire, and expand here in our commonwealth rather than in one of our competitor states. We must move Pennsylvania's economic competitiveness by advancing pro-growth public policies that reduce the baseline costs of creating and keeping jobs in our commonwealth, including spending restraint, tax reliefs, limits on loss and abuse, regulatory reform, and ensuring a prepared workforce. And unfortunately, there's a lot of work to do. There are many experts here today that can speak to specific provisions and law changes and intricacies of the tax code, but there are two major points that we want to highlight today, things that we think we need to change in order to change the conversation that we're having in Harrisburg as we move forward on a lot of the initiatives brought here today. The first is that competitive does, competitiveness does not happen in a vacuum and that stability and predictability of state tax liability is paramount. States are constantly competing for business tax inve for business investment, and, uh, um, the PM and PMA calls upon the General Assembly to push for legislative oversight on rules stemming from the Department of Revenue to enhance the predictability of state tax treatment. And second, that the Commonwealth ought to deploy some form of dynamic scoring and or macroeconomic analysis in economic modeling to more accurately assess tax code changes to reflect potential growth. On the first point, business competitiveness amongst states is a constant battle. Too often we hear legislators proclaim that as long as we're not as bad as New York or New Jersey, that we will be economically competitive and, and attract business investment. However, business capital is more mobile than it has ever been. High-performing states such as Utah, North Carolina, 
Georgia and Indiana are looking at Pennsylvania companies and attracting them to locate in their states with promises of enhanced pro uh, prosperity, and it's working for them. The truth, truth is evident because Pennsylvania's gross domestic product is slow, our workforce is shrinking, and our population is decreasing. It's not just taxes that are the issue in Pennsylvania, but that's another hearing for another day. Nonetheless, when it comes to taxes, we ought not to aspire to mediocrity, but instead emulate what these high-performing states are doing. With that being said, while high-performing states are doubling down on their success and doing more with less uh, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to attract business investment, we do need to look at changes in states like New Jersey and ensure that these bad ideas don't, crease across, don't creep across our borders. New Jersey just enacted a litany of tax changes, some good but mostly bad. You heard about some of them already, but one of the most notable changes recently made in New Jersey was the move to mandatory unitary combined reporting. Report after report and study after study shows that mandatory unitary combined reporting adds complexity and compliance costs but generates no windfall, especially in states that already have add back provisions such as Pennsylvania. Furthermore, New Jersey decoupled many facets of its tax code but not in good ways. It changed policies that in many instances won't allow companies to take advantage of many of the benefits of the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, and, and there's um, analysis from the Tax Foundation in, in our main testimony. Conversely, states such as Utah are lowering corporate and individual rates and seeing the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will bring enhanced revenue to state coffers. And again, there's more evidence in our main testimony. For many months, Pennsylvania fell into that trap that New Jersey has fallen victim to. In the afternoon on the Friday before the Christmas holiday, Governor Wolf and the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue changed the rules on employers saying that they could not depreciate an asset until it was sold or decommissioned. It was made effective retroactively back to September 27, 2017. This put Pennsylvania businesses at a unique competitive disadvantage. It was stunningly punitive and rendered Pennsylvania near uninvestable. Though this rule was fixed, um, thank you, Representative, for your sponsorship of your, of, of your bill, um, Representative Ryan. Though this rule was fixed by the legislature with the passage of uh, ultimately the tax code language that passed with the fiscal year 2018-19 budget, we will never know how much potential business investment Pennsylvania missed out on while that rule was in place. Therefore, therefore, one of our calls of action in this hearing is that there ought to be legislative review of the rulemaking by the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue. We often hear from companies that more important than the tax rates themselves is the predictability of the ta and the predictability of the tax rates and the tax treatments and the processes. The erratic rulemaking by the department in this instance calls for legislative review of future rule changes so that employers have more predictability and certainty in their state tax planning. Our second call for action is for Pennsylvania to adopt some form of dynamic scoring in the analysis of tax policy. Let me begin first by saying that the Independent Fiscal Office does an extraordinary job in analyzing state fiscal policy. Let it also be known that the call for dynamic scoring does not mean that that type of analysis is always 100% correct. However, by not accounting for any kind of dynamic scoring or entertaining the request for this type of information, no positive progress can be made for tax reforms that will occur in this Commonwealth for the foreseeable future. The reason why is because all, currently, all corporate tax reform is viewed with a price tag on it, not with the notion that an opportunity exists for growth. With growth comes tax revenue through purchasing, new hiring, the expansion of business operations, as explained by the, the panel here today. The economic activity is currently not forecasted in any way by the Independent Fiscal Office or any other research department within state government. No economist, Republican, Democrat, conservative, or liberal would ever conclude that a tax rate of 100% would yield increased state returns. However, this is the type of stagnant modeling that is being done at the state level. Minimally, some microeconomic modeling might be used at the state level when it comes to consum consumption or sin taxes to reflect lower use of a product such as tobacco. However, it seems to rarely be done and only in very specific circumstances. As I previously said, every state 
tax reform measure comes with a price tag. For example, if a proposal to increase the net operating loss to a full 100 percent, as it's been done in nearly every other state from our current 35 percent, the fiscal note would surely show a major, major blow to state revenues. However, with this tax change would surely come investment as those companies carrying those losses forward by investing their operations in other states might look to expanding their operations here in Pennsylvania. This is unaccounted for, and without some sort of dynamic modeling, we can't begin to have the conversations with state policymakers about them. Therefore, we urge the General Assembly to look to what Congress passed in 2015 in regard to the Congressional Budget Office and Joint Committee on Taxation to include a dynamic score to tax policy changes. The same should be done in Pennsylvania. Congress adopted a concurrent resolution in the budget year for fiscal year 2016 that required the CBO to the greatest extent predictable to incorporate macroeconomic effects into its 10-year cost estimates for major legislation that congressional committees approved and when predictable a qualitative assessment of the budgetary effects following 20 years. Right now the rules of the game are rigged against us. By only viewing tax rate decreases as a cut to the bottom line of the state treasury and not analyzing the net economic growth that these policy changes could have, we will never be able to enact meaningful tax reform that is so needed in this commonwealth. Therefore, again, we urge the General Assembly to take the necessary steps to adopt a form of dynamic scoring that includes macroeconomic analysis of tax proposals. Pennsylvania needs to see the private sector grow at a faster rate than government. That is the ultimate measure of a sound economy, and with a sound economy, we can position ourselves to make the changes necessary to be an attractive location for businesses. Let's make it the smart business decision to hire, expand, and invest in our commonwealth rather than in one of our competitor states. But with the trillions of dollars in investment ripe to come back to the United States over the next several years, thanks to the Ta Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we must now position ourselves to be an attractive place for that investment to land. Thank you for your willingness to listen to our testimony, and I will do my best to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to address this distinguished panel on behalf of Pennsylvania businesses. My name is Nat Fissel, and I'm a CPA and a partner in the firm Smith Elliott Kearns & Company, a regional CPA firm with a staff of 175 professionals. $23 million of annual revenue, and six office locations with one in Maryland, five locations in central Pennsylvania, including two here in York County, located in Hanover and downtown York. Our clients are primarily closely held small to middle market businesses, which contribute significant economic activity here in the Commonwealth. While we are in the first year working under the framework of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and most taxpayers have yet to file their first tax return under this framework, there are four primary areas that I can identify as ripe opportunities for taxpayers to reduce their federal tax burden. These are opportunities that we are actively consulting and advising our clients with this year so they can maximize their tax savings within these areas. We're actively consulting with our clients with projecting 2018 tax liabilities, so we have been able to quantify potential tax savings under the TG, TCJA on a client-by-client -client basis and communicate those results to our clients. And we'll also address any problems or issues we see within these areas, including how Pennsylvania tax law interacts with these federal provisions, which sometimes can pre pre present additional burden on the Pennsylvania taxpayer. Let's start with the lowest hanging fruit, the lower individual rates. The majority of our clients are organized as pass-through entities, including partnerships and S-corporations. As you may know, taxpayers who are owners in pass-through entities pay tax on their share of net profits from these entities on their, on their individual tax return at individual income tax rates. With the highest marginal rate reduced from 39.6% to 37% and other rate reductions across the board, we're seeing most individual taxpayers will see a reduction in their federal tax burden to, due to the lower rates, despite the loss of some deductions, such as the $10,000 cap on state and local taxes, the elimination of miscellaneous itemized deductions, and the elimination of personal exemptions. As an example, on the higher end of clients I work with, I uh, just had this week, 
a physician with a successful specialty practice uh, realized $123,000 of federal tax savings due to the lower rates primarily. These tax savings will provide for additional capital to be reinvested in the business or to put uh, to otherwise efficient use in the private sector through some other economic activity. Additionally, coupled with the lower rates, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act modified the alternative minimum tax, commonly known as the AMT. Originally, the AMT was intended to apply only to the ultra-wealthy to ensure that they paid a minimum level of federal income tax. However, over the years, the mechanics of the AMT was not adjusted as it should have, and it added to the tax burden of many middle-class taxpayers, especially those with significant state and local tax deductions and multiple personal exemptions. With the phase-out of the AMT exemption increased from $109,400 to $1 million for taxpayers filing, filing jointly, and these amounts also being indexed for inflation in the future, I've seen practically every client that I've looked at with uh, AMT burdens pre-2018 to not have any AMT burden in 2018 as projected. Typically, most clients I work with that had AMT liabilities would have anywhere from three to $10,000 of um, alternative minimum tax on average. Overall, Pennsylvania has a favorable individual income tax rate as compared to other states. However, the inability to offset losses in one class of income against income in another class and the inability to carry forward these unused losses is one area I believe Pennsylvania could address in a more taxpayer-friendly direction. The second provision of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act I would like to address is the Section 199A deduction, also commonly referred to as the pass-through deduction or the Qualified Business Income deduction. Basically, Section 199A allows pass-through business entities, such as S-Corps, partnerships, and sole proprietorships, to deduct up to 20% of their qualified net business income. This results in a reduction in the effective tax rate on the pass-through business income. For example, the effective rate on income qualified for the 20% deduction taxed at the top rate of 37% would be effectively taxed at 29.6%. This deduction is a lucrative and real opportunity for many small to medium businesses to realize substantial tax savings. However, there are a number of businesses where this deduction will not apply. For what the IRS has deemed to be specified service trades and businesses, the deduction will phase out for taxpayers filing jointly with taxable income from 350 to 450,000. Some examples of specified service trades and businesses include attorneys, accountants, which I'm personally disappointed in, uh, side note, doctors, investment advisors, and others. Unfortunately, these service industries are prime examples of dynamic and robust domestic job creators which in many cases will not realize the benefits of the Section 199A deduction. My real world experience is that this does not sit well with clients who will be in that phase out mode as they are left out of one of the most tax, one of the most pro taxpayer provisions of the, of, the tax, of the Tax Act. The third provision of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that is attractive to the clients I work with is the expansion of the Section 179 deduction. The Section 179 provision allows businesses to fully expense qualified capital expenditures in the tax year these assets were placed in service. Prior to the Tax Act, the total deduction was limited to $510,000 and was increased to a million dollars for 2018. The increase in the deduction provides businesses with, with additional incentive to make significant capital purchases, knowing that a qualified purchase can significantly re reduce their federal tax burden. And certainly the gentlemen to each side of me have testified to that fact as well. However, as you are aware, may be aware in Pennsylvania, the Section 179 deduction is limited to only $25,000 for pass-through entities, not to mention that bonus depreciation is entirely disallowed. There has historically been a significant difference between the federal and Pennsylvania limit for the Section 179 deduction. The increase of Section 179 in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act only makes this divide wider, 
I encourage Pennsylvania legislators to address this gap to benefit Pennsylvania taxpayers. I also remind you that depreciation deductions such as 179 and bonus depreciation are only timing differences. What a taxpayer deducts today on an asset purchase is less they can deduct in the future, therefore it's not a permanent difference. Additionally, tracking multiple depreciation calculations for all of their uh, depreciable assets for federal and state tax purposes only causes more time spent and unnecessary compliance that could be time spent better otherwise and or unnecessary cost to taxpayers paying their advisors to keep up with these records. Lastly, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act reduced the tax rate for C corporations from a top rate of 35% to a flat rate of 21%. As I mentioned previously, most of our clients are pass-through entities, but we do represent a number of closely held C corporations. The reduction in the corporate tax rate will certainly provide for realizable tax savings for these entities. However, the Pennsylvania corporate tax rate of 9.99% is among the highest of state corporate tax rates. When the state tax rate is coupled with the federal corporate tax rate and the effect of double taxation of corporate profits distributed to shareholders as, as dividends, a C corporation is typically an unfavorable form of business structure for small to medium businesses in Pennsylvania, despite the reduction in the federal corporate tax rate. Therefore, I also encourage Pennsylvania legislators to also address our high corporate income tax rate in a way that would make the Commonwealth a more attractive environment for businesses. In conclusion, as an advisor for many businesses that are examples of economic drivers in the Commonwealth, I can affirm that the provisions of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act I have discussed will provide significant federal tax savings for many of these taxpayers. Biz businesses need to retain more of their own capital and pay less to the enormous leviathan encompassing the many layers of federal, state, and local bureaucracy. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act allows for a bit of headway in this direction, and speaking on behalf of taxpayers, I encourage both federal and state legislators to continue to enact tax reductions that will, allow, that will allow taxpayers to retain more of their hard-earned capital that can be reinvested in their business and create other economic activity which creates jobs and perpetuates our opportunistic system of capitalism that has provided our great country to be the world's leading economic powerhouse. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, up for Congressman Scott Perry. Gentlemen, thanks for your attendance. And, and uh, as I stated, I think we're hopeful to go back next month and look at 2.0, which is essentially the, uh, the permanence in the rates so there isn't the uh, the insecurity of not or of knowing or ex at least planning for them to expire at some point. And, but aside from that, there might be some other opportunities, albeit small, if we can reach some consensus. And I'm wondering from your standpoint, other than rates and brackets, because we've already been through that, and I suspect that's going to be too heavy of a lift. The House wanted four. We ended up with, with more, obviously, as you know. But are there some broad uh, policies from your standpoint that you that you've realized either that we didn't handle correctly or that we missed uh, that we might be aware of that that somebody like me can advocate for on our on your behalf when when we're going through this in the next couple of weeks I'm not on ways and means but uh, we'll have an opportunity at some point to weigh in and, and sometimes we can be successful anything on your minds that uh, that would make a difference in your businesses that we've missed no, no. I mean, we were at the federal level. We are extremely well placed. Uh, I mean, within and you're, you're specifically talking within the tax area. I mean, there's things regulatorily that we're sure. still tripping yeah. over and yeah. whatnot. In in the tax area, and, and we're always talking about cuts. You know, part part of it and part of affording them. And you're you're a very much a, a spending side guy, so you'll get this. Is getting rid of some of the the other tax incentives and preferences and expenditures that are clogging up the system and and just pick, trying to pick winners and losers and never being very good at it because that's what enables you to keep the rates where they are and not see them bouncing back up as, as you know, we're all worried that they do regardless of whether or not they're supposed to be permanent. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, one of our large expenses and is, is our health care costs. And, you know, I know we had, you know, uh, you know what I call a near miss on that or a near make, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's any chance of revisiting with that again with the current administration, but you know, healthcare costs are just crippling uh, this country. Just 
all the way around. There's um, little good news on that front, just to let everybody know. The uh, we you know the House voted to, to uh, repeal the excise tax on on medical devices. It sits on the Senate's doorstep, and I think you will see a continual er eroding to to uh, to what extent possible politically uh, possible of of the the deleterious provisions of the Affordable Care Act, but a wholesale uh, repeal, so to speak. I think that train, at least under the current circumstances, has has passed. I, I don't certainly don't see anything in the next two months in, in this session. Uh, but next session, the president says he wants to get after it again, and I and I hope we do. I think we are close, um, and uh, and I think we absolutely. It's one of the number one or two things that most constituents continue to talk to me about is health care costs. But you won't see that in what we do in a, in a tax. Uh, a tax discussion coming up in the next two months. Um, just one comment on that, uh, and I did allude to that, but I think uh, broadening Section 199A would go a long way, um, get rid of the exclusions, make it apply to any trade or business, and that could go a long way with taxpayers. Representative Kiefer. <laughs> Tom, I wish we could put you on a loop and just have you running on the House floor. I, I think that's what doesn't resonate with a lot of legislators is that day-to-day -day grind that you do um, and, and that you take three steps forward here and you get hammered two steps to five steps by the Commonwealth. Uh, one of the questions I have, uh, which is just intriguing uh, regarding your motors and the analytics, you retrofit current existing motors with those sensors yes. in, for analytics? We, we, we can put them on existing motors as they are. I mean, it's something complicated because you have to do communications and there's cyber security issues, right. so we have to usually stay outside of the corporate loop. So we've had to invent the solutions so we can talk to these motors without it going through there. Uh, but yeah, we can retrofit them, but that will be the next trend, and we're talking to a lot of the manufacturers now uh, that just they'll come that way. Uh, so we'll just be able to plug in and we won't have all this this going out and putting them on and trying to figure out the communication systems and how far a sensor can c talk to you before you have to have a repeater, that kind of thing. So that's the trend, yeah. But you're still looking at, that. that's a pretty significant capital investment that you, you'd be looking at again. Yeah, and it, and it changes the business model, which is why the ca capital expenditures are so important. Rather than going out and you, you go out and you tell a company, well, it's going to cost you 120000 to put in a system like this. And they said, no, we'll just wait till it breaks, thank you. Uh, so the, the new business model is we just sell them a service. The same way you see software as service and these other things as a service, we make the investment and put it in. And we sell them the fact that now your, your, your motors are not going to break down, your productivity is going to be better, blah, 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 and charge them on that way on an ongoing basis. So, yeah. And another area I wanted to hit on was education. Um, and, and you're talking about access in the workforce and, and, and what you're getting on your return of your investment. And I think that's something uh, really huge that you guys have to have a seat at the table, um, more prominent. I know we have an apprenticeship, we just invested some money in that, but I think it's, it's you know, we have for the past, what, 15, 20 years, it's everybody has to have a four-year degree and that's the only path to success. Um, and, and we continue to grade and judge our, our high schools and, and education systems based upon how many kids they get to college. Um, and I think it's it's getting more people like you or, or Bailey's in f at the table with the Department of Ed to say, okay, here are the opportunities. I don't know that students or parents, for that matter, know all of the opportunities that are out there right now. And we're going to see this more and more as we can see our population yeah. decline. Yeah, we believe that 100%. I mean, they're, they're good jobs, very well-paying jobs. And e even the, the college degree, to a degree, has, has just become kind of that Willy Wonka golden ticket. It, it doesn't it's not a real credential, it's just an admission ticket. Because uh, we get the college graduates coming in too, and now they don't want to get their hands dirty, so they tend to run around and go back out much quicker. But the fact of the matter is that degree doesn't have what we need them to have regardless. And, and one last question that I have for um, uh, Nathaniel is, um, how many, I, I know the Department of Revenue has, it's called enhanced revenue collections. Mm -hmm. How many on average cases of those do you have a year? Uh, are, are you referring to like the um, the notices they're sending out, kind of digging? Think you owe X Y Z. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I know. We we probably across our whole uh, firm firm wide, probably several hundred. I would tend to believe. I know myself. You know, one person in the firm. I've probably dealt with twenty five last year. Okay. Um, and it's never ending. 
paperwork. Right. Yeah. It's pretty onerous. I mean, yeah. it, we think you owe this much based on nothing. Right. Right. Thank you. Represent Ryan. I'd like to thank you all today. You've done a phenomenal job. I, I want to just bring up a couple of different issues relative to what you've been, and I've been a CFO and I am a CPA. Uh, relative to the dynamic scoring, Carl, I could not agree with you more. I, and I want to give you some concrete examples. So I know that the members you have in front of you are very sensitive to this issue. I've talked with the IFO on a number of occasions, so let me give you an example. Uh, we had the 1099 miscellaneous provision, which became part of the bill, which I'm surprised no one's screaming about yet. Uh, I've been screaming about it. We put a bill in to eliminate it. It was the most asinine, idiotic thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And I asked the question, what's the impact if other states retaliate? And here was a response I got. We're not permitted to look at what other states will do. There's an economic concept called satiris paribus, means all of the things being equal. And all I can ever tell you is there's never, ever in history ever been a situation in which all other things are held equal. There's a, there's a quid pro quo, there's, a, there's a, an elasticity and inelasticity of demand. Relative to this Senate bill and the House bill that passed, I was the author of the House bill. That bill passed in record time due to the cooperation of, of our leadership, got over to the Senate uh, probably in early March, early April, I forget exactly what it was, and it sat there. And the problem that happened was I got responses back from businesses that I've been dealing with that basically said the fact that it, the Department of Revenue could do these things without any type of clearance or understanding the impact is absolutely silly. And the damage has been, I can tell you of two specific corporations that had expansion plans in Pennsylvania and canceled it only because that a Department of Revenue could do this without interruption. The next issue is per diem. We've had a bill in there about per diem issues. Pennsylvania is one of the only states in the United States that does not allow our citizens to adopt per diem. And what that does is adversely affect the lowest income Pennsylvanians. People who are higher income can afford to have uh, tax preparers prepare this kind of information. And we have citizens, and let me give an example. Truck drivers are being negatively impacted. Uh, we've got a bill which is being drafted now. We're hoping if we're successful in re-election that that would be introduced, that any Department of Revenue rulemaking must include dynamic scoring, and the independent fiscal office must look at that. So the question I ask you on this is that when you look at the overall business climate in Pennsylvania, are you concerned about how the state operates and whether or not our processes are so broken that it causes you to hold back on your business investment. I don't know that it causes us to hold back per se, but we sure grit our teeth a lot. Yeah, I, I just think that, you know, some of the things that we have to go through on a daily basis, because we're required to go through, we don't have the time and the talents to really put out there to try to generate additional business or maybe provide additional benefits to, to our staff or maybe do the additional training. You know, we can only do so much just like you folks, you know. There's, you know, only so many hours in a day uh, that, that you can work. I work a tremendous amount of hours, as you probably all do too. But, you know, it probably holds us back. You know, when you get into some of the paperwork side of it and things that we have to do, it just gets to be a bit overwhelming. If we had not reversed the Department of Revenue Bulletin 2017-2, would you have bought those buses? Probably. Okay. <laughs> we, we certainly would not have moved as quickly as what we're moving on our capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. That was part of our thinking. And, and, and to get back to your original question, I mean, it certainly raises the hurdle. So we only take, you know, the opportunities we look at have to be bigger. If we're going to jump through all these hoops and have to pay all these costs, especially outside costs, um, it raises the hurdle rate. So mm -hmm. it, it does affect it that way. Do we, we stop dead in our tracks? Do, do we avoid it? Yeah. No. We look for ways around it, and then we just say, no, this is too complicated. It's going to cost too much, and yeah, that does stop. happen. You have to continue. I mean, from our standpoint, our clients, you know, uh, you know continually expect to have newer equipment, updated equipment. They want Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, we've been required to put electronic logging devices on all of our equipment. You know, I can call up and look and see, you know, where one of my vehicles is at any time. 
as Tom was speaking to his sensors on his motors, we have sensors on our buses. When they throw a code, it can text me and tell me exactly you know, where, you know, where my vehicle is and what type of code the engine has thrown. Can we drive that another 100 miles to you know, get to a service center or could we bring it back home that day? So those are the types of things that you know, we're doing, but we have to continually invest in additional new equipment. And it, it's very expensive. You know, new bus, uh, it's $560,000 for one vehicle. And then you, know, you have to hire somebody that can drive that and, and know how to handle it and not damage it. So it, it's a real challenge you know, to be able to find people, uh, hire them, train them, and then handle your equipment because that has my name on the side and people are real quick to pick up the phone and call you you know I got cut off or you know you almost hit me you have a wide variety so we've solved a lot of that problem by putting cameras on the buses normally when we tell them we have a camera on the bus 90 percent of the time the conversation goes away I'll answer your question, question with a question I mean when's the last time we had a major manufacturer decide to locate in Pennsylvania um, we hear all the time that we're, we're at least starting to make the like, site selection surveys. I mean, Brascom USA uh, looked at, at um, uh, Marcus Hook as a possible uh, location. Uh, we lost out on that investment to Texas. When's the last time we've had a car manufacturer locate in Pennsylvania? Boeing was looking to expand their operations. They looked at Pennsylvania ultimately. Um, was it South Carolina or Washington State that they ended up going to? Um, so it, it's not even necessarily so much about how quickly are we growing existing operations, but we're not able, uh, I mean, money is liquid, so is water. It flows to the path of least resistance. And um, there's a lot of resistance in Pennsylvania, which is why you don't see those investments come here. Representative Sako. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Health care costs, I know, I hear it all the time, major costs for most of the businesses. Uh, and, there, and it's a shame because there are so many good free market solutions out there that, that would help drive that down. I'm hoping that federally we'll work on that. I know the president's working on drug prices and so forth. Um, so I hope to see some of that in the future. But I want to give you some hope on property tax because uh, if you remember last November, we just passed a constitutional amendment to allow local districts to exempt 100% of the assessed value of your home. Now, we still have work to do with enabling legislation to give them uh, the taxes that they, can, that they can use to implement that. But I also want to uh, put a plug in for House Bill 76 because it's all of you that have to pressure the legislature to pass uh, now House Bill 76, if you're not familiar with it, would eliminate the school property tax, replace it with a 1%, roughly 1% increase in sales tax and a roughly 1% increase in the income tax. But the, the beauty of it, the most important part of it, is the cost control mechanism. You're talking about costs, uh, school property taxes going up. The cost control mechanism is important, and that is anything above the inflation rate uh, has to go to a voter referendum. So you want to build a $40 million uh, stadium that's above the inflation rate? You have to ask the voters. You want to give a 555% three-year contract increase to your employees? Got to go to a voter referendum. That gives school boards the, the authority and the leverage to say, all right, uh, you want to be more reasonable instead of a 555% increase? How about a 001? We don't have to put that on a referendum uh, because, you know, they succumb to the pressures and of, of the staff, the administration, and the unions and so forth. So there's hope out there. Keep plugging away. Keep pushing for... Uh, property tax reform, we were almost there. It was killed one time in the Senate by one vote. And so um, I think we can get this, get this through eventually. Thanks. Representative Mao. Thank you. Um, I'm just a simple guy from Adams County, as I like to say. But uh, when, Carl, you talked about uh, tax reform for businesses, and I totally 100% agree with you. But tax reform for that, if I'm not mistaken, is basically going from 9.99 to something else. With, and, and of course, they were in a new day now, but just last year's budget, we borrowed $1.5 billion against future generations to pay the bills. What would happen if we lowered that corporate tax rate to what the average is across the country, whatever that is, and now we had another shortfall and had to borrow money? I mean, are, are we rolling the dice by doing that? How would you approach that from, a, from the Manufacturers Association aspect? So, so 
that's why I think that some of the, the dynamic modeling is, is so important because we can't even begin to have that conversation without some kind of third party looking at those numbers. I would argue that um, there are so many um, businesses that file their taxes in Pennsylvania um, under the, the um, as an S corp rather than as a C corp because of our 9.99. Well now with federal tax reform going through and lower, and one of the other reasons is because the United States had the highest industrial, industrialized, uh, you know, uh, rate in the, in, the, in the world. So, I mean, if you have, you know, the highest flat rate at 9.99 and before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you had like the 30, four thirty five percent from a national perspective if you located your business in pennsylvania you were choosing to basically have the highest tax rate that you could possibly have in the industrialized world um well if you, we could with now with the reduction of the corporate tax rate to the 21 percent from uh, up in the, the mid 30s if we could lower pennsylvania's corporate net t uh, tax rate how many more companies would register themselves as a C Corp because there are advantages to registering as a C Corp. There are things that you can do as a C Corp that you can't do as an S Corp. But why would you do that in this in in the in right now when you're going to be paying a nine point nine nine CNI rate? Um, so, I, it, it, but again, these are, these are, I don't know. I mean, th there really is no answer to your question. And, but I mean, at least with what we're calling for with some kind of form of dynamic modeling, we can have actual economists and programs and algorithms. There's so, I mean, we have world-class institutions. We have access to more information now than we have ever had before. These dynamic models are not perfect, but they are at least a place where we can start the conversation. Um, let's look at where that sweet spot is, um, because right now we know 9.99 is not doing it. I think that we could lower that rate and actually bring in far more corporate tax revenue because you'd have a lot of businesses switch over to pay it at, at, at the C-Corp level. And, and I thank you for that answer, uh, but by dynamic scoring, does that put you in the ballpark of, of finding out how many would change the way they file? And, and where do you set the baseline? I think that, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it, there are so many forms of of dynamic scoring, um, and it would be up to the legislature really to put in the parameters what what um, what that should be, and look at different models. And that would you know be a lot of time and testimony for another hearing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there are absolutely different economic models that could account for that. No no doubt. Maybe I just ran a. I, I mean, I actually have sitting in my folder an analysis that I ran on banning polystyrene statewide and what that would mean for the overall economy. I mean, you can model anything. Um, so um, you know th th that that type of uh, that, that shouldn't be that that difficult of a model to run. As long as the gamble's not too big, but with the with the scoring knowing that uh, the odds are that we're going to. Uh, realize more revenue, then it's easy for us right. to make that vote. But right now, under current conditions, if you said we're going to lower the corporate net income tax rate to 6.99, any economic analysis that is done at the state level would only be looking at what are our current revenues, and by taking it from 9.99 to 6.99, it, they, they basically are doing like a simple division problem. Sure. They're not doing anything else. So without some kind of form of dynamic model, we can't even begin to have the conversation because all that any legislator is going to do, all that any gubernatorial administration is going to do is say, here's the price I got on it. I'm not even looking at it. I can't tell you how many lawmakers' offices, how many leaders' offices I've been in that, you know, you, you talk about, you know, the NOL carry forward, you talk about CNI, you talk about um, even things like mandatory unitary combined reporting, and it's like, well, here's what the price tag is going to be. But you're not accounting for all of these changes that are going to come into effect um, with those changes. Um, and that's what, that's what we're calling on the legislature task for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Klunk. Thank you, Representative Grove, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Um, I actually am from Hanover. We have a large number of manufacturers um, in our region, and I can probably name at least 
five uh, manufacturers that have gone through some sort of expansion, huge equipment uh, purchases here over the past couple of months because of this tax reform. Um, and my husband, he actually works um, in sales for a very large uh, machine vision technology company here in the United States. It might even be one that, uh, Tom, you guys use. And they have just been gangbusters um, with uh, the number of, of uh, equipment purchases here over the past couple of months, which is wonderful for our um, homegrown companies here in not only Pennsylvania, but uh, across the United States. My question is, um, I think for Nat, um, since he probably has the best um, experience on this. So we always talk about New Jersey and New York and how you know we're better off than, than those two states, but we're right on the border with Maryland, and I know you guys do a lot of work in Maryland. We never really talk about Maryland, um, which I think in this region, that's, that's our competitor um, from a regional focus. So where do we sit um, from a tax perspective comparatively to Maryland? Because I know a lot of my businesses in my district do business in both states. And can you talk about um, some of your clients that you do see with how Maryland treats um, taxpayers versus Pennsylvania and where we can maybe uh, learn something from Maryland or uh, not do something? Something that Maryland does yeah just kind of from a broad brush perspective um, Maryland is a higher tax state they have higher rates on the individual side now their C Corp rate may be lower I don't do many Maryland C Corps um, but overall Maryland tax rates are higher but where their advantage is versus Pennsylvania is ease of administration the Maryland tax system is you know, starts at federal taxable income and just decouples from where they've identified where they want to decouple from, from federal tax law, rather than Pennsylvania that just has its own, you know, crazy system of all kinds of rules and regulations that are, I mean, quite honestly, very difficult for businesses uh, to comply with. Uh, so uh, that would be the advantage Maryland has over Pennsylvania although um, but from from an effective rate perspective overall we have a more favorable lower tax state one one last question um, if, if you happen to become ever say the Secretary of Revenue from a you know you have that experience working with taxpayers and mm -hmm. submitting you know all of that information for all of these requests and how they deal with taxpayers and businesses and accountants what would be your top three things for reform at the Department of Revenue that maybe we can work on, um, you know, with that that agency moving forward to make it more taxpayer friendly and more, you know, easy to work with when it comes to responding to a lot of these requests? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I would say that it from uh, from that perspective. Um, it, my observation over the last few years is that the uh, Department of Revenue has become what I would say rather militant. Uh, they come up with something they want to look at and they hone in on an issue and then they do the data mining and just send out notices to taxpayers challenging prior positions. Um, I've spent countless hours over the last few years dealing with uh, like kind exchanges, not on real estate, but on equipment trades that they challenged. Um, they basically took, I forget the, the number, but the PA income tax bulletin that, that in a nutshell said, you can, uh, Pennsylvania will recognize a like kind exchange if the company keeps its book and books and records on the gap basis of accounting. And that's what taxpayers were following as advisors we were telling them to follow and then you know in the last few years they've challenged that on many occasions I dealt with over a dozen of them personally challenged them at the Board of Appeals level and lost uh, but succeeded on many of them at the uh, Board of Finance and Revenue um, so I'd say just uh, overall the flavor from the Department of Revenue should be you know helping taxpayers um, from a more proactive way of um, you know being less stuck in endless compliance and um, rather you know look at ways to make the state more um, 
economic friendly so that it grows the economic act activity and grows um, tax revenues naturally rather than looking for it under every rock and corner that they think that they can get it. Um, that would go a long, long way. Nate, one follow-up question. Yes. Under the, the federal taxes, they, they get rid of a lot of the um, unreimbursed allowable employee expenses, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, we still have that under the, the personal income tax at the state level. For the amount of time that a taxpayer would hire an accountant mm -hmm. to go through that, is it basically from the PIT's perspective, since we have a lower PIT, basically pennies on the dollar? And, you know, it depends. You know, I mean, most uh, clients that are employees, I mean, their, their expenses that are unreimbursed are overall pretty minimal. Um, but there are exceptions to that, where you could have a client with, you know, that has significant out-of-pocket costs uh, that their employer doesn't reimburse. Um, but what I've been seeing there is the Department of Revenue has challenged those on many cases where they'll disallow those expenses for no substantiated reason. And say, send us copies of everything, your mileage log, you know, uh, send us your second child as well if you'd like. And, and it, it is just, yeah, it's just ridiculous. And a lot of times what uh, taxpayers will do, they'll be like, well, you know, this isn't worth it, I'll just forego it um, because the time and energy it's been challenging it isn't worth it. Some people do it just based on principle to get their $100 or whatever it may be. But you know, that's just another example of some of the, the uh, militant operations, I would say, that are going on. If, if we were to take up broad-based tax reform, mm -hmm. broaden the base, lower the rates, um, would it be a positive for Pennsylvania taxpayers if we would get rid of the unreimbursed allowable employee business expenses to lower the overall rates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that would be a very favorable. Okay. All right. So I have any, any further questions? Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you for, gentlemen, what you do in day-to-day -day business for, for your employees and, and businesses in Pennsylvania. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Uh, our last pa panel I'm kind of excited over, um, entitled Success Pennsylvania Can Follow. Um, hi, Dr. Key. how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Uh, we have Jonathan Williams, Chief Economist and Vice President, American Legislative Change Council. Dr. Kenneth Hegney. Hey. Hege, thank you. Hey. Uh, state economist for the state of Georgia and Honorable Jason Sane, uh, Majority Chairman of the House Finance Committee and the North Carolina House of Representatives. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to start with you, Doctor, and um, um, tell us about the, the great work you've been doing in uh, the state of Georgia. Well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Um, very quickly, uh, Georgia's income tax is tied pretty closely to the federal income tax structure. And so part of every legislative session is to update our code for changes to the federal code in the prior year. And in a typical session, that's a generally a fairly small incremental change to our existing tax code. Obviously this time was quite a bit different given the uh, size and complexity of the uh, Tax Cut Act passed by the federal uh, uh, Congress. And so um, this year we had to first get an understanding of what all those changes meant for Georgia. Now we have a fairly simple tax structure. Our corporate income tax rate is 6% flat for regardless of income. Our individual income tax is a progressive rate, but barely. It's almost flat. It reaches its top rate of 6% at $10,000 of taxable income for a married filing a jointly tax payment. So it's, it's pretty close to just a flat tax. And when we ran, uh, analyzed all the changes to the federal tax code, assuming no other change to George's tax structure, just conforming to the changes in itemized deductions and all the other uh, parts of the uh, Tax Cut Act, we found that over a five-year period, our tax revenues would increase by about $5.3 billion. And the uh, 
the press here quickly started referring to that as our windfall. And so uh, obviously we weren't, we would never intend to conform and not make other changes to uh, adjust the actual revenue impact. But the, you know, if you think of what the feds did, it was essentially lower rates broaden the base. And when you broaden the base in Georgia, then that leads to higher tax revenue. So uh, our analysis was that it was a very substantial tax increase if we didn't make any other changes. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about what to do and when to do it. Uh, we thought about not acting right away, see what happens with the changes to the federal uh, or the impacts of the federal changes. Our Department of Revenue didn't like it because on their end, we'd have two parallel tax structures in place in large measure, federal versus state. Uh, they would have a hard time adjusting, working with uh, the third party software vendors to align if we wanted to wait to do things at the last minute in 2018, uh, it would be hard to get the third party tax software providers set up to do that. So we just, we realized we had to act in the, in the current legislative section. Session was started early January and typically would end by the end of March of this year. And so pretty quickly our governor, our legislative leadership decided that we would uh, uh, have to change our tax structure uh, we had some principles, I think, that guided their thoughts about what to do. First, we're conservative in a couple of ways. It's a, a Republican state, but we're also cautious about making changes. We didn't want to make changes that were too abrupt, too large, that could cause disruptions to our budget. And so part of the outcome was to phase in changes over time. Uh, there was a strong impetus in our particularly in the legislature to reduce marginal tax rates. Uh, we preferred to keep our in individual and corporate in, uh, tax rates in sync. So that top rate is 6%, we wanted to keep about the same. And because the federal change is all sunset in the end of 2025, we decided ours should as well. Uh, if the feds come back and change theirs, we obviously have the opportunity to change that sunset date as well. So what came out of this was a, a basically a three-step process and effective January 1 of 20, 2018, we doubled the uh, standard deduction for all filers. For example, the uh, married filing jointly deduction went from three to $6,000. And that is sort of in line with what the feds did in raising that from 12 to 24,000. Uh, the next step will take effect January 1, 2019, and we'll reduce our top marginal rate for both individual and for uh, corporate taxes to 5.75%, so a small step reduction. And that is uh, baked into the law. That will go ahead on January 1, 2019. And then the final step uh, is scheduled to take effect 1120, and that will be reduce that top marginal rate a further quarter percent from 5.75 to 5.5%. Uh, that requires that the governor and the legislature uh, ratify those changes. I think it's before January 15th of that year but it re requires an active step by the governor and the legislature to take effect. And then, <clears throat> then again, we, uh, we sunset all that on 12-31-2025 uh, in line with when the federal changes are scheduled to sunset. So uh, when we look at what we've done to our revenue plan, over the five year period, we estimate that tax revenues will decrease by 76 million Overall, uh, the first three years, we anticipate revenue increases. And I think you have a chart there that lays that out. And then the final two years, we see tax decreases, and those would continue for, uh, thereafter, assuming the uh, sunset is not allowed to take effect. 
Uh, so that's what we've done. Uh, I'm not sure there's much to add beyond that. But happy to take any questions now or, or later. We'll do questions uh, at the end of the panel. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Jonathan. All right. Well, thank you, Representative Grove and uh, the members of this panel, uh, and many of whom are good friends of ours at ALEC. I'm Jonathan Williams, Chief Economist at ALEC and Vice President of our Center for State Fiscal Reform and uh, a co-author of the Rich States, Poor States book, which I brought copies for everyone today. I won't read it for you, and as channeling the earlier presenter, uh, you're welcome. So today, uh, what I want to do is just, uh, since there's been so much good said already today, is synthesize a few of the, the major points and then give you a little bit of a, a look at what we're seeing in the other states and what we're seeing in terms of big uh, free market uh, tax reform as it relates to what happened in Washington, D.C. Uh, for those of you not familiar, ALEC is the nation's largest nonpartisan individual membership organization of state legislators. So it gives me the opportunity to go out and work with our 2,000 uh, members and allies across the states. I've been to all 50 states now uh, working with state lawmakers and advising them on best practices and I'm very proud to sit here with our 2018 national chairman, Representative Jason Sane of North Carolina and as you'll be hearing from him more later, uh, North Carolina really is the gold standard for states that have moved towards pro-growth tax reform over the last several decades, what they've done over the last few years. Um, so we've heard many good points about dynamic scoring, which I think is important. We've heard good points about government not picking winners and losers, which is an essential principle of good tax policy. And then we've heard the essential linkage between spending and taxation, two sides of the same fiscal coin. You cannot get it right on the tax policy side unless you get it right on the spending policy side of the equation as well. Um, so briefly, my thoughts on, on federal tax reform. It's a big deal. 1986 was the last time we remade our federal tax code comprehensively. That was a long time ago. In fact, Top Gun was number one at the box office in 1986. It was a very, very long time coming. And let's hope to God that we don't wait another 31 long years before we see another federal tax reform. And I was heartened by the comments of Congressman Perry, another ALEC alumnus, uh, who mentioned that we need to hit tax cuts 2.0, tax reform 2.0. And there's several things we need to do to, uh, to look at making it even more pro-growth than it was. Um, I think just as important to talk about what the key elements of federal tax reform are, it's just as important to talk about what they were not. And that is, of course, from day one, we heard from the mainstream media and others uh, that are perhaps big government, uh, big tax apologists, that this would be Armageddon for the United States economy. Then, of course, when that didn't materialize, it was crumbs for the taxpayers. Uh, what we are seeing, ladies and gentlemen, in members of the committee, is not crumbs. We're seeing more than 700 businesses, both publicly traded and privately traded, large and small, announce wage increases, bonuses, and many other uh, great things that we're seeing. We mentioned, uh, Congressman Perry mentioned the GDP growth. That, of course, is going to translate into uh, better wage growth and other things going forward. Uh, certainly from the corporate side, it was a game changer, going from the highest in the industrialized world with our 35 percent uh, federal only tax rate, now down to the average of the OECD world at 21 percent. And when the American men and women of our workforce can compete on an equal playing field, my money's on the American worker. And I think you know, we're going to see those results going forward. Uh, and then certainly a big implication, something that Alec got involved with, was the limitation on the state and local tax deduction, the SALT deduction. It's really stopping the subsidization of high tax states. And this, a lot of people forget, this was Ronald Reagan's unfinished business from 1986. And he thought it should be completely eliminated. Of course, uh, the House version of the plan did, uh, did that. The Senate version came in and put the $10,000 annual cap. And what it does, of course, is give states the incentive to live within their means because they can't pass the bill on to uh, the good uh, men and women of Pennsylvania and other states that are lower tax states. Now, let me get to the untold story of federal tax reform because that, what I mentioned, has gotten a good amount of publicity over the last months, as it should have, because it's been a, really a game changer for our American economy and competitiveness. When you hear stories of companies uh, bringing manufacturing back to the United States from Mexico to my home state of Michigan and a company like Ford Motor Company doing that, uh, that's incredible. We would have thought that was unthinkable just several years ago. Uh, but the untold story is the linkage of federal tax reform to the states 
and what it means for their budgets, what it means for their opportunities to cut taxes. And as the, uh, the late Yankee great and occasional philosopher Yogi Berra would say, this is like deja vu all over again. And this is exactly what we saw post-1986 after Ronald Reagan's tax reform, that a majority of states cut tax rates, especially income tax rates, because of the federal linkage of the code, since most states start with taxable income or AGI. I know Pennsylvania is a little bit unique in that uh, respect. Even though you're unique in the linkage respect, you're not isolated from what else is going on, of course, with the other states. And that's a point that my friend Carl Marrera made earlier, is nothing is done in a vacuum. This is one of the key factors that we measure every year in rich states, poor states, is just how much states are moving in the right direction to lower costs of capital, to lower tax rates on capital, both personal and individual income specifically. In the last five years alone, we've seen more than 30 states significantly reduce taxes, with the majority of those tax reductions being on capital-based income taxes, personal and, and business income taxes. And that's certainly been the story so far in 2018. We have seen states, uh, some of whom had not cut taxes in 20 plus years, states like Iowa, a multi-billion dollar net tax reduction under Governor Kim Reynolds in the legislature. Um, in Idaho, a massive tax reduction uh, this year, both on personal and corporate income. Of course, you've heard the story of Georgia, uh, another state that moved dramatically in the right direction. But let me point out, even your neighbors in Maryland cut taxes this year under Governor Larry Hogan. Now, they spent a good percentage of the extra money, but they also did reduce some taxes, and that's uh, something they can be very proud of. And even Bernie Sanders, Vermont, and this is a little known fact, they actually have reduced taxes on net this session as a direct result of the federal tax reform. Uh, so for all the, uh, really the complaints about what tax reform would do for certain states, you hear this from high tax state governors like Andrew Cuomo and others that have been leading that charge with this, uh, in my view, a bogus lawsuit against federal tax reform, even they are realizing the benefits because of budget surpluses and some of them are using it to cut tax rates back home. So I think the, the overall message for Pennsylvania is you can fall behind simply by standing still in this very competitive environment. And if nothing else, you know, look at this example of North Carolina. North Carolina started the discussion in the Southeast. I could say probably in, in the minds of many Georgia legislators, they may not have had that discussion over marginal tax rate reduction if it wouldn't have been for North Carolina going first. So think about this scenario this year where we have multiple states, we even may reach a majority of states between this year and next that reduce taxes on a significant basis because of what federal tax reform empowered them to do. That puts an opportunity in front of you, or I guess it puts a threat in front of Pennsylvania to say you can fall or either even further behind by standing still. Pennsylvania, currently in rich states, poor states, by the way, ranks 38th in economic outlook. This is a deterioration from a 33rd ranking just in 2014. Uh, so it's certainly uh, other states are moving in the right direction, and Pennsylvania has fallen even in the last four or five years. A couple of things that stick out in our metrics is the business uh, tax rate. Of course, when you add any local to the statewide rate, uh, that even puts you much higher. Uh, the one state, coincidentally, that high, had a higher state-only corporate income tax rate, and that was Iowa at 12 percent. I mentioned they cut taxes. They are now below 9.9 percent uh, as, as a state-only rate. So that's one thing to just keep in mind what they did this year. Certainly still having a death tax on the books here in Pennsylvania is a negative for economic competitiveness. It's something that North Carolina had as part of their package was to repeal their death tax. Other states in the region, such as Ohio and Indiana, have done the same thing in recent years. And even Delaware repealed their death tax last year. And then uh, finally, not a topic of this discussion necessarily for tax policy, but being a Michigan native, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about right to work as it revolves around economic competitiveness. There has been such a movement in the Midwest. My home state I never thought in my lifetime would be a right to work state. You look at places like Wisconsin, uh, West Virginia, uh, Indiana, and others, and more recently Kentucky, move in that direction, adding pressure. And there are many companies that we talk to as they look to invest state to state. Boeing was mentioned earlier. Others in this race for capital that will not even consider a state as part of its site selection process unless it's a right to work state. It's a binary variable for them. So in conclusion, 
I think 2019 is going to be a very good year for state revenue, for state budgets, if this robust economic recovery does keep up nationally. I think for a couple of other factors that are a bit outside of the scope of, of this hearing today are going to only add to that effect. One uh, is the ruling by the Supreme Court in the Wayfair decision on remote sales tax collection. Personally, I think that was an incorrectly decided decision. That's a debate for another day, but what it will mean is more revenue for states as they look to reach across their borders to tax non-resident uh, businesses and, and have them be their unpaid tax collectors uh, for remote taxes. I know Pennsylvania has been especially aggressive in this area going after the marketplaces uh, and that's uh, one of only a couple of states that have gone down that road. We also had the Supreme Court ruling in the sports betting case, the New Jersey case, that now has legalized sports betting. That's another avenue for potential uh, additional state revenue. So I do think you add the economic growth component from tax reform to the issue of other revenue sources being enhanced because of the Supreme Court rulings. 2019 is going to be a banner year. More money is there. More surpluses are there. And it's more opportunities for these states that are already ahead of Pennsylvania to become even further ahead of Pennsylvania. And you might say, if we can't cut taxes, let's say maybe your governor doesn't agree with this panel today in cutting taxes, hypothetically, what would you do? Uh, you know, first of all, you look to set the stage for cutting taxes perhaps in the future, dynamic analysis. If we could get it right in Washington, D.C. and have the CBO start looking at things dynamically and under the Bush administration having the U.S. Treasury Department look at things dynamically, it can be done in states and it should be done in states. Uh, certainly watch the spending growth. Don't let the surplus money get baked into the baseline on spending. I, I know our appropriations chair is here and has done a great job watching spending growth, but things like the Taxpayer Protection Act, a Tabor type style limit on, on population and inflation. We have followed the Colorado uh, case study on that extensively over the last 25 years. We think it's a great formula to keep government from growing faster than the private sector economy. And then finally, looking at the rainy day fund issue. As Pennsylvania has one of the lowest uh, funded rainy day funds in America. In fact, uh, as I understand it, it would the current rainy day fund would fund one-tenth of one day of government operations in the state of Pennsylvania. And you know who your uh, competitors in that regard are. It is Illinois is the only state that has a worse rainy day fund funding level than Pennsylvania. So instead of building the spending baseline, perhaps looking at those uh, type options, because I'll end with this, being compared to Illinois is never a place that you want to be. Thank you. Our good friend, Representative Sane. Thank you. Uh, Representative Grove, thank you. Uh, members, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I'm excited to be with you. Uh, I was on Facebook this morning. I, I put that I was happy to be here to talk about tax reform, and one of my advisors said, please don't do that. You're letting out our secret sauce, and uh, they're going to find out what we're doing, and, and, and they're going to be more competitive, and we got to up our game. But that's okay. Uh, I like competition. I know that you do, too. And I want to share with you what we've done in North Carolina. And one of the first things that we did was talk about what our goals were. You know, before we ever set out to do anything is, is we got in a room and, and uh, both our, our House and Senate uh, colleagues said, what, what are our goals? If we're going to do tax reform, what would that look like? Um, you know, capital and investment will flow to where it's treated best. We know that. Uh, that's why we're seeing success in North Carolina. Uh, but we also have to watch spending. Congressman, you, you touched on it with what's happening in D.C. Uh, we, it, it is both sides of the same coin. As, as Jonathan said, uh, you, can't, you can't do one without the other. So you, you do have to control your spending. But one of the, the things we agreed on, we, we wanted to reduce tax burden on families and businesses. We wanted to close tax loopholes and eliminate most credits exemptions and deductions only available to a few taxpayers. We wanted to broaden the tax base and lower rates, encourage economic growth, and we wanted to enact an evolution, not a revolution, of tax policy over time. So looking at it long game, not just short game. Um, as Representative Grove, I was telling the story last night, I, I do like to go fast. Fast is okay, but it's got to be measured, and, it's gotta, and you've got to look at it from a, from a long-term perspective. And then, and then again, maintain that commitment. Uh, don't, don't just get a win here and there and then go, okay, we, we've done tax reform and walk away, away from it. It has to be ongoing. So we looked at personal income tax uh, as part of this. We, uh, our top personal income tax rate was re reduced from 7.75% to 5.25%, and this is over the time period of 2011 to 2019. Uh, now we're one of the lowest in the Southeast. 
uh, standard deduction increased from 6,000 to 20,000 for married families filing jointly. So we made sure that folks on the lower end of the economic scale were taken care of and making sure that uh, we're encouraging uh, growth in that side of the economy as well. We eliminated special credits, reduced itemized deductions, and simplified tax calculation. We converted the child tax credit to a deduction. And we estimate that about uh, 354,000 taxpayers have been removed from the tax rolls by January of 2019. We also looked at our sales taxes. Uh, as we broaden the base, sales tax rate decreased from 5.75 to 4.75 in 2011. We're broadening the sales tax base to include repair, maintenance, and installation services, and sales tax is more stable and less volatile revenue stream to fund government operations. What we were seeing prior to uh, my side of the aisle taking over in 2011 is that we had these huge roller coasters of, of not knowing where revenue was going to come from. We'd end up with uh, more one year and less the next. So we've tried to stabilize that so that we can be certain and so that we can communicate to folks wanting to in invest in our state and wanting to live to our li come live in our state that there's stability and that they can have some certainty. Um, the goal was, goal was to create a pro-growth economic model by instituting a consumption-based sales tax on goods and services and reduce income tax dependency. Then we looked at the corporate tax rate. Again, all this happening, happening simultaneously. In 2011, North Carolina's corporate tax rate was 6.9%. In 2014, it was reduced to 6% and revenue triggers were implemented to continue lowering the tax based on collections. So I heard, uh, Representative, you're, you're bringing up some of the fear that my colleagues had, had expressed that, you know, what if we're wrong? Uh, what, what if we take this big gamble and we're wrong? So what we did, we made sure that we put in revenue triggers so that if we are right, and we know we're right, but just in case, we'll put revenue triggers. And when we are right, we'll lower that tax rate even more. So we met our goals and we continued with tax reform. In 2015, it was reduced to 5%. In 2016, it was reduced to 4%. In 2017, it was reduced to 3% 3, 3 based on revenue triggers again. And then in 2017, the corporate tax rate was reduced by the North Carolina General Assembly again and will fall to 2.5% in 2019, being the lowest rate in the nation. Then we looked at franchise tax. We lowered the rate for S-Corps effective for 2018 tax returns. Flat $200 for first $1, one million of tax base $1.50 fifty per person, dollar fifty per thousand dollars of tax base that exceeds one million dollars. Increased minimum tax from thirty-five to two hundred, and increased maximum tax on holding companies from seventy-five k to hundred thousand. So roughly ninety-five percent of S corps in North Carolina have a net worth of less than a million dollars. Tax base change uh, deduction for debt repealed that in twenty fifteen and reenacted in twenty twenty. So we're making sure that we're looking at everything and see what marinates and what works allows tangible property base uh, reduced by amount of debt owed on property. So we've had lots of success as, as, as you've heard, but it's, it's happened over time and we've continued. We didn't just do it once and spike the ball and say we've won the game. We know that there's at least you know, three more quarters to play. Uh, other key reforms in North Carolina, our budget reforms have controlled spending. As I told you, if you don't do that, uh, you will get yourself in trouble. You know, uh, those who don't like tax cuts and don't like economic growth, uh, apparently they like failure, uh, always point to the Kansas model, right? And they say that Kansas did it all wrong because they cut taxes and, and, and now they're in, in a quagmire. Well, the problem is they didn't control, control their spending. I mean, that's the other side of that coin. Uh, and, and, and legislators from Kansas will tell you that. Uh, regulatory reforms that reduce government burden. So we went through regulatory reform, making sure that, that these folks that, that spoke to us right before Jonathan and I, uh, who were out there in the daily grind, making sure that government got out of their way so that they could run their businesses the way they, that they wanted to and the best way that they knew how. Uh, unemployment insurance reforms that reduce debt. We, we, when we come into office, we had a $2 billion debt in our, uninsurance, uh, in our unemployment insurance. Uh, we, we went from a debt to a positive and, and have since continued to reform that as well. Uh, strategic transportation investments. Program prioritizes road funding. We got away from what used to happen in North Carolina that if you were uh, from the, uh, the party that was in power, then we built roads to nowhere and wasted a lot of taxpayer dollars. Now we, we take it and we look and we fund where it's needed and don't fund you know, places that really don't need additional funding and, and roads. So all that is, has uh, led to a lot of success in North Carolina. If you compare us from 2011 to 2017, and some of the last numbers that I have, in 2011, $2.5 billion debt on unemployment insurance, as I alluded to. In 2017, $1.8 billion savings reserve, a state record. Uh, 2011, 10.4% unemployment rate. 
2017, 4.1% unemployment rate across the state. When I first came into office in 2011, my district was at 11.5% unemployment. It is now at, at right at 3%. Uh, so we've seen lots of great results. Uh, our tax foundation rank uh, in 2011 was 44. Our tax foundation rank in 2017, number 11. Uh, in 2011, 3.8 million people employed. In 2017, 4.4 million people employed. But again, all that while we were reducing spending, making sure that we kept our eye on the ball, making sure that we looked at the things that were most important and funded those things first, and then said, what could we eliminate and what could we, how could we get out of the people's way? Um, and I'll allude to, or I'll, I'll, I've alluded to it, but we'd like to be competitive. You know, uh, Representative Grove invited me up. I love coming, I love visiting. Uh, you have a beautiful state, but we will take your business. I, I will tell you that today. I am here to try to do that as best that I can. It's incumbent upon you to take the challenge and say, all right, challenge accepted. Now we're gonna try to do this. We're gonna try to, to institute tax reform. We want to do, and I know you do, you wanna do what's best for your constituents. Uh, doing, performing these tax reforms and others, as you look at your specific needs and, 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 and uh, where you need to go, uh, you, can, you can make your state competitive as well. Then it's on us to, again, be competitive. As, as my friend from Georgia alluded to, you know, we started on tax reform and all the states around us started as well. So it, it is a constant evolution. Uh, Jonathan, correct me, but at one point on, in rich states, poor states, we had rocketed up to, what was it, number two. Uh, we're back down to number seven because other states are competing. So that, I, I'm, like I say, I'm a competitive guy, so I say, well, what can we do next? Uh, again, making sure that we don't do too much too fast, but that we're doing it in the right direction and, and the right measured way. I'll give you a couple more economic success successes for North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina ranked best state for business in Forbes in our 2017 rankings. Uh, North Carolina wins 2017 Prosperity Cup by Site Selection Magazine. Uh, North Carolina among 16 states prepared for economic recession, uh, according to Moody's. Uh, North Carolina passes 30 states in three years in the tax foundation rankings. Uh, North Carolina's top five for wage growth, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, North Carolina is the best state for startups, fit small business. North Carolina, one of 12 states with a unanimous AAA rating. North Carolina, number one for tech job growth and North Carolina Technology Association. Tech's kind of my thing. I do tech and tax. I'm probably the most nerdy guy in the house in, in, in North Carolina. Exciting stuff. Um, but North Carolina's uh, fifth best state for business, according to CNBC rankings. And then in 2017, North Carolina unemployment, 17-year low, according to the Department of Commerce. So it can work. Uh, you just have to have... Uh, agreement, broad agreement among your colleagues. Obviously, you got to get at least a 50% plus one, but having that buy-in and knowing what your goals are and then having measured results, putting those triggers in, there's nothing wrong with those triggers. Say, okay, we, made, we met our goal and now we're on to the next thing. That would be my advice to you is just, one, don't lose sight of it of where you're going. Look at it long ball versus short ball. Uh, you're, you're in it to win it from, from not just today, but for, for the next couple of decades. I've got a 10-year-old. Uh, the reason that I serve in the House is because uh, there are many 10-year-olds in our state, but m the most important one is mine, according to me, and I want to make sure that he has a future. And I know that you want to do that for your, the folks in your state, and so I, I encourage you. Uh, and again, if I can be a resource, uh, just keep in mind that we're always going to be competitive, and we always want to, we always at least want to be just a little bit better, but, but, but I think that competition is very healthy for us and that we can do a lot. Thank you. Chairman Saylor. Representative, I want to thank you for coming today. I, a few weeks ago, I actually already told my staff to start looking at North Carolina, and, and Representative Grove, of course, his activities at Alex and stuff has been a, a great uh, help to us as well here in the Commonwealth. So, uh, but I wasn't sure when I seen you were coming today whether I was going to have to be an interpreter or not. Uh, one of my good friends from North Carolina, when I was president of Pennsylvania JC, was Mossy White. He owned a oil distribution, him and his father owned an oil distribution company. So I would have him come and speak to our Pennsylvania JCs about things that the JCs in North Carolina were doing. And I'd have to constantly say to Mossy, slow it down. So it's great to have you here. Uh, we are taking note of what North Carolina is doing, uh, and you guys are doing a great job. And uh, we're looking forward to being competitive with you. In, uh, being up there in the rankings. We've, I've always complained, I think Representative, most of us on this panel have always talked about, we always seem to be the 50th state to do anything. And uh, I think we've got the right attitude in the General Assembly now to finally start being innovators or at least following the lead of some of the states like yours that have grown jobs, lowered taxes, and made uh, the communities in North Carolina so, so, so successful. And so uh, again, I wanna thank you for traveling to Pennsylvania and uh, espousing your wisdom to us and 
hopefully uh, we'll take note and uh, follow up. Thank you for being here. Th thank you. And I, I, I live with a, a lady from Connecticut. My wife's from Connecticut, so I had to at least adjust my accent a little bit. So hopefully you can understand me a little better than your friend. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Kristen Hill. Representative Sane. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Um, I think what the chairman meant to say was game on. <laughs> uh, we appreciate the uh, you throwing that challenge down, and we accept. Um, but what I would like to, to get from you today is um, we agree. We agree that everything that you've done in North Carolina is something that we need to do here in Pennsylvania. But what was the impetus? What created the, that sense of need or urgency to bring your colleagues to the table um, to be willing to engage with you and embark on this journey? And, and I believe it was um, Justice Brandeis, who called our states the laboratories of democracy. Um, I'd like to find out how North Carolina decided to take advantage of that strong national economy and move forward. Representative Hill, great question, and, and I thank you for it. Uh, a couple things, just so you understand from a historical perspective. Uh, Republicans have not been in control uh, for quite a while in North Carolina. In, in 2011 or 2010, we, we won the elections, we won uh, uh, majorities in both houses. Uh, it was our time to either put up or shut up. We had sat in the minority for a long time um, and you know, complained about what was happening in our state, the, the debt that was accumulating, the, uh, the higher taxes that were being put on our people. So it, it was our, our turn. So that was one, one reason to, to make sure that we could show what we could do. Uh, second, um, we had a lot of, uh, of innovators that came in all at the same time. Uh, you're here today talking about it. The fact that, that you're willing to do that uh, shows that you've got one of the, the first things that you need is that folks that are just willing to, to have that discussion. Um, but that was probably, those two things right there were probably the biggest drivers. Uh, and then as we saw some, ex some success, it created more success. The other thing that drove it was just like you all and what we've talked about today, uh, when you see that you're, you're you know, 35th or you're 44th and all of these rankings, you know, we got tired of losing. Um, now we want to get tired of winning. Uh, we're not tired yet, right? So we want to continue. Uh, but, but we had been tired of losing, you know, in, in education and in, 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 in taxation and all these things had, had just really made a state that had really innovative people. Uh, we've got a great university system. Uh, we do have good roads. We've got, we had everything going for us except our tax rates were just abysmal. States were passing us by. Uh, so as we, as we looked at that and just from an analytical standpoint, we knew what, what could happen. We, we had a hunch that if we changed this, but if we measured it, uh, success could breed success. But, but just honestly, just being tired of being last. Uh, and that, that probably is what motivated most of our members who wanted to see this reform. It wasn't without some fights, as you might imagine, uh, particularly within our caucuses. There's, there's disagreement uh, time and time again. But, but we took the time, and, and even one year, uh, Jonathan, you'll remember that we stayed till September fighting over some tax things. And this is, this is when Republicans controlled the House, the Senate, and we had a Republican governor. But end of the day, it was worth the fight because we, we end up with a much better product. Thank you. Thank you very much. Representative Kiefer. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Nathan Benefield can attest, Pennsylvania loves corporate welfare. Um, and, and what I'll hear even my Republican colleagues say is, oh, well, we have to. We have to, to be competitive to, to get it. How much corporate welfare does North Carolina get? So I, I, don't, I don't have an exact figure, but what we have done over the course of from 2011 until now is eliminate a lot of those special carve-outs uh, where we're not picking winners and losers. The best, the best incentive we can offer you as a company is the fact that you're going to have a low corporate tax rate. You're also going to have a low personal income tax rate, and you've got a, you've got a state that's looking forward. Uh, you know, we've provided certainty uh, so that if you're coming to our state, you know pretty certain that the folks that are in charge right now, and if we stay in charge, you're going to have a, a, a pretty uh, uh, sustainable place to live. It's not, you're not getting a lot of surprises. We're telling you what we're going to do up front. We're going to continue to do that. And so companies are looking to our state to come to move there, but, but also understanding that our mom and pop businesses are going too. We're also telling them, we're, we're signaling to them hey, you're important too. As a matter of fact, you make up more of our economy than anybody. Uh, we're going to treat you with respect and we're going to make sure that you're, we're not doing, building this on your backs and, and carving out uh, you know, special things for, for big corporations. We're, again, across the board, making sure that everyone's treated fairly. So tax fairness is good. 
but, but also knowing that, that we're not going to pull the rug out from under you later. Uh, it's, not, it's not a bait and switch. We're, we are keeping our, our eye on the spending, making sure that we're doing the right things. Um, by eliminating a lot of these, you know, of course, there's gnashing of teeth when you start doing that. Uh, folks who, who want to uh, complain, threaten they're leaving the state and everything else. But as you start to see, uh, that's not what's happening in North Carolina. They go, wow, we, we really do like this low corporate tax rate. We like this low personal income tax rate. And we have more money to buy things. And then they reinvest in the state. And we've been running surpluses. That's probably the one thing I haven't told you all, is that we continue to run surpluses through this. So we actually have more money available. We've put more money in a rainy day fund. Uh, we're investing in the things that are most important to us, all while cutting taxes. Representative Mao. Thank you. One quick question. Are all your state employees unionized? And <laughs> do, are you a right to work state? We are a right to work state, yes. What percentage of your employees are unionized? And how do you control the annual, we need 3%, especially when you get a governor that's not of your party that has the right to, by executive order, sign contracts and, and give very lucrative contracts. How do you keep spending under control given the fact that probably 70% or more of your state expenditures is in labor? Right, so, so uh, one, we're not unionized. Uh, we, we got a state employees association, but it is different from a union. Um, and so one, we're right to work state, so that, that helps as well. Uh, but, but through our reforms, making sure that we're right-sizing government, making sure that um, you know, we're eliminating some of the, some of the waste, uh, and also restructuring government. Uh, I told you I'm also that I'm a tech appropriator and, and the tax guy too. So uh, as we've consolidated our, our Department of Information Technology, uh, making sure that we're, we're getting you know, better bang for buck on our tech spend, on, on anything that we're doing, uh, as, we, as we've reviewed and reformed state government, uh, we've been able to eliminate uh, a lot of the waste uh, which then gives us uh, money that we've actually been able to pay our state employees more. So we show that we, we do uh, appreciate what they're doing and, and what they're doing on behalf of, of taxpayers. And so we're reinvesting in them. But it's, but it's not been this uh, at the barrel of a gun uh, type of, of uh, negotiation. It's something that we've said, yes, we want to reinvest in, in our workers. But all the while not growing state government so that it's unaffordable and that we can't keep up with that. So it's, again, it's got to be a multi-pronged approach to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Scone. So how do you fund your schools? And, and are your, you have a strong teachers union there. And how does that work? So, so uh, the state does uh, pay the bulk of, of schools, uh, the, the cost of schools. County commissions build the schools, but we, we pay for the teachers and so forth. Uh, I alluded uh, to your, in your question, uh, Resident Hill, about how you know, education was one of the things that we kept showing up last in. Uh, teacher pay being part of that. So as we've seen surpluses, as, as our reforms have worked, we're, we're reinvesting. Uh, one, taxpayers are getting more of their money back, but we're also taking one money, and um, I think this will be the fifth or sixth consecutive year that we've raised teacher pay, so that we're, we want to be competitive. I, I, I'm not going to say that we're, we want to be number one, but we want to be competitive so that we can at least be in the ball game to recruit and retain good teachers. Uh, so we've not had some of those struggles that other states have. I, I, I understand that that's a challenge. Uh, but, but we, as, as, as you might imagine, when we embark upon this, this mission of, of, of tax reform, uh, we would hear that, you know, what's going to suffer, you know, is it going to be uh, education or, or state employees, or what, whatever. We, we've continued to, to keep our eye on the ball there, too. Uh, it, it's tough and it's and sometimes painful, but we, but we've made sure that we uh, have done that as well. So uh, you you really do have to, um, you know, when I talk about long ball, I mean it it is is taking all of those things into consideration. There's not just one silver bullet thing that you're going to do. You you've got to do all of these things, and that's hard to do, but it can be done. So do you have county school districts then? We have county school districts, and then you have a state contract, statewide contract to pay the teachers. Correct. And, and medical uh, benefits and all that to statewide correct. contract. That's correct. And there's local supplement that can go along. Uh, and I know we're not comparing exactly, exactly apples to oranges. Uh, Representative Grove was kind of telling me how, how you folks do it. A um, little different from us. But the results are still the same. That you know The, mon the money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, the bulk of that comes from the state uh, as far as how we pay teachers. Uh, but there are local supplements. And I'm, I'm sorry to beat this, but so in the big cities, I guess like Raleigh or whatever, where there's a big differential, you have 
salary differentials for the rural teachers and the and the big city teachers? Uh, I, the differential comes at at the local supplement. Uh, that's that's where the difference is. Um, and that's paid for by the county. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank. Doctor Hegney, when you were doing your tax reform in Georgia, um, what were some of the issues that, that you faced with working with the General Assembly and, and stakeholders? And when you were scoring your tax changes, did you use a dynamic model or was the battle over a, a static model? Uh, the, the battle was primarily over a static model. Uh, early in the most recent session, given the progress of our revenues and given the passage of the, the federal tax reform, we had raised our revenue estimate for uh, fiscal year 2018 and for fiscal year 2019 because we anticipated faster growth. We, however, didn't try and factor in uh, explicitly any real revenue change from or dynamic revenue change from the anticipated Georgia tax reform. And uh, I think the, the issues really were getting everybody comfortable with the, you know, first the size of the revenue impact from adopting the changes of itemized deductions and all the other things that were in the, the uh, federal uh, reform uh, and how that could impact Georgia if we didn't do anything. I think people were startled that it was such a big number over you know a five-year period. And then I think it was the other problem, or not problem, but I think the other dynamic was uh, a challenge of how far, how fast do you move uh, trying to recognize that it is a big revenue change, but we want to be cautious in how we implement our reaction to it. So I think that those are, that's really the biggest issue of how far, how fast, and uh, the representative from North Carolina t talked about the uh, the triggers they had in their tax reform, and we thought about how can we do similar things. We thought about a, a revenue trigger for that third step of our reform in 2020, but we decided it would just be simpler to have a, another vote on it to make sure it would be ratified and implemented. Great. And um, I actually don't know of any other states with the state economist. Are you are you it out of the 50 states or? No, I think there are, there are other people around. Uh, Georgia has a slight, a pretty different way of estimating revenues. Uh, a lot of states have a collaborative process. We have a governor. He decides the revenue estimate that goes in the budget. And so uh, my job is to advise him on what those estimates should be but it's really his decision wow um that would be scary in our state if we if we uh, unilaterally <laughs> did that wow um yeah thank you so much uh dr hagney great work in in georgia we we appreciate and um uh love to see the competition so uh congratulations on your on your tax cuts thank you thank you representative grove if i may uh, just to piggyback on that real quick when you think about the dynamic modeling, uh, you know, our staff is, has the same constraints probably yours, yours does too, and uh, they're great, they, they do wonderful work, but, you know, they would always come to us and go, well, if you want to cut this, it's going to cost this. Mm. Okay, well, wrong question, right, because how much more will we have? I mean, that was, that's really the question we needed to ask. Um, so my friend beside me here, uh, Jonathan, has been wonderful. We would go to outside sources when, when staff just really wasn't within their – uh, ability to do so, or at least their, 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 their job description to do so, and, and find out what does that look like. Uh, he's a trusted partner. We used other folks like Tax Foundation uh, and, and really reached out to the experts on those things and say, if we do this, what does that look like? So that, so that we didn't get bogged down in our caucuses going, oh, we'll see there, we can't afford it, we can't, we can't pay for that. The, the question is, how could we afford not to? Because, uh, again, we've seen the, the surpluses that come with it, but, but that wasn't necessarily something we were getting at the staff level. Yeah, that's that's one thing we face. We have a small business tax package we try to get through. Um, three bills. Mine had the largest cost of a hundred million dollars, which would apply a no, uh, NOL net operating loss within our PIT to try to have small businesses compete with big business. The the other two made it through because they were small costs, and it was after the budget was done, and everyone's like, "Oh, yours cost too much." I'm like, 
but you, it, businesses are asking for it. It'll help them grow. We'll create jobs and we'll become more competitive. It, it's it's it falls on deaf ears because it's it's simply a numbers game of loss of revenue, and the only thing that matters is propping up your budget uh, rather than thinking forward and saying we will gain more revenue um, through tax changes uh, comprehensively. Well, and I think it gets back to tax reform hero uh, Jack Kemp's famous uh, story is the way to raise substantial and long-term revenue is not by raising rates, but raising the amount of taxpayers coming into your state. And so looking at the population flow issue of the low tax states and states without income taxes, specifically being just huge drivers of population growth like Texas and Florida, Texas is going to gain another three to four congressional seats in the U.S. House because of the in-migration. Florida is going to gain another two or perhaps more. Uh, you know, look at that model and, you know, yes, those people are not paying income taxes, but they're paying sales taxes and property taxes and all the other fees to fund core government services. And I think just from an outsider's unbiased perspective, uh, not having a dog in the fight when it comes to promoting North Carolina personally, you know, the, the really the, the proof is in the pudding, though, in that look at what they were able to do for teachers. I mean, having a 9 or 10 percent pay increase for teachers as a direct dividend because they got competitiveness right, they got in-migration right, they got policy right. That is something that just doesn't uh, go to someone on the center right of the perspective. Instead of seeing these protests from teachers asking for more and asking tax rates to go up, no, that's how you do it naturally is by having a competitive state economy. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. We appreciate it. Um, congratulations to Georgia and North Carolina on uh, some, some economic success. Uh, closing remarks from uh, Congressman Perry. I think we'll have our, our detractors and our critics, but, and, and we might get some subtleties in the policy, and we work on some of those things, but generally leaving or allowing people to keep more of what they earn. When people say, you know, I think Representative Mal asked regarding dynamic scoring, how, how do you know? How do you know you're going to get there? Uh, because you don't have this revenue shortfall. You have to have some faith in the fact that intuitively you must know that people keeping more of what they earn is a good thing and that government is not a uh, is not the best uh, uh, determiner of how resources should be utilized the market does that best and, and we've learned this over and over and over again but we continue to challenge ourselves certainly uh, the scoring uh, it's, it's an issue in congress it's we do everything in 10-year windows and and it, it and it really hampers us but um, at some point, you have to believe in, in, in the economics of, of, and, and, and human uh, behavior that comes from, you know, from teachings of Adam Smith and some, some of the greats. These things work, and you know, I just got a, I got a new book um, uh, about communism, which, look, socialism is an economic construct, and capitalism or uh, communism is the political construct that's necessary at some point to force the economic construct because people don't like it. But the, you know, it's, it, the title of the book is Doomed to Fail. We keep trying and trying and trying this socialist model because somehow uh, we want to equalize everyone. And I, I think we've gotten away from the circumstance where people know that Dawn and I aren't equal. She does, she does a lot of things better than I do. I might do one thing better than she does, but we are equal under the law. Uh, and, 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 and people rise to their highest level if you allow them to do that. And a tax structure and a regulatory structure that allows for that uh, is, is best for every single person, whether you live out in the country, whether you live in the city, whether you have a big, you know, a grand education or whether you don't. Some of the, some of the most successful people have, have the least of education, right, and, and maybe even opportunity. So I think at the federal level we have kind of paved the way. Uh, I'm glad that they, they brought you folks here from, from other places, uh, although I lament that even when I talk to some of the, the different organizations in, in Pennsylvania and, uh, and they're mad at me for my position on tax, on regulation, on labor policy, and so on and so forth, I say to them, look around, you're taking our jobs. You're taking our jobs and you're taking our children, right? And, and God, they want to go where the opportunity is and it's not just the sunshine and the fair weather. That's where the opportunity is. And um, 
when you when you talk about Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, other states, that Pennsylvania is the state that's going to lose those congressional seats because we are competing again uh, among states. So I, I think the federal government, look, it was it was not as much as I would have liked to have seen uh, in tax reform at the federal level. And when I say tax reform, I mean tax reduction, right? It's not just reform, it's reduction. And policies that um, that uh, support and encourage people to, to do their best and be their best. And, and you can see that uh, in the discussion, and I think some of the frustration here at the table from our colleagues here at the state level, these are all fine, fine people that work hard and understand and get it. They are frustrated because we see what can be, right? We can see, we can see what can be, and we're tired of seeing our children leave and, uh, and, and our citizens overtax for, um, for the same things that you can do in, in a much better way. And so we appreciate you coming here and uh, uh, and we know the way. These, these folks are very frustrated because they can't get there because there are some certain folks in the political arena that won't allow us to get there. But we uh, we appreciate your encouragement and your your leadership and showing us the way and continuing to shine the light and uh, and to be a voice for what we know intuitively must happen. And so. Uh, thanks, uh, Seth, for putting this on. Thanks to all my colleagues who I know well and cherish your friendships. And thanks for you folks for coming up to visit in the audience for, uh, for participating. It's been a privilege to be here, and it's a privilege to serve, as you know. And, it, and, it's a, and it's a great privilege when you look at people and they say, thank you for the raise that I got and for allowing me to keep more of my money. That's really one of the grand things that, uh, that, we, can, that we can be happy about if we're able to do it. So thank, thank you, Seth. I will close with this. Um, Pennsylvania is a great state. We're, we're, we're a wealthy state. We have great resources. We have great workers. We have great potential. Um, we need to do it better. We need to do it smarter. And we, need, we know what works from the federal government at a national level to our sister states who are doing it at their level to counties, to local townships, to school districts who are, who are doing the right choices on behalf of their taxpayer and, and the citizens they serve to do it better and smarter and more efficiently. Um, there is no reason Pennsylvania is not number one. There's absolutely no reason. It takes a will, it takes a drive, and hopefully this is the start of that conversation. Uh, and this hearing was geared to do one thing, let the residents of Pennsylvania know what works. We know it works nationally. We know it works in other states, uh, and we can get there. We just need to push the policies and make it happen. Um, so I appreciate everybody's attendance. Appreciate my colleagues' willingness to come out on a, on a beautiful day. And uh, Representative Phillips Hill for the final, final closing remarks. No, I, I really want to thank Representative Grove. It, this was really his initiative to put this all together. Um, I think we know that we can't. Uh, escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. We've taken some of those important steps. We know that there's much to be done. We know the challenges that our businesses are facing. We know the solutions that other states have implemented. Um, we know what the outcome will be just looking what's happened at the federal level. Um, thank you, Representative Grove. We're all going to keep fighting for a future that provides economic opportunity and financial security for all of our families and generations to come, and we really appreciate your leadership on this issue. Thank you very much.